Good man, how you doing? I'm doing really good, really good. Let's talk about Starleaf because I mean that's that's yeah. a, a really fascinating thing to to talk about. Yeah. Um, and that was like 2015, right? Isn't that when yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah. Starleaf was 2015. Um, yeah, Starleaf is really interesting journey because that came out of nowhere, just the idea for it, and it all manifested pretty well. I, I look at Starleaf like a pretty damn good B movie in the genre of like supernatural and uh, I guess weed. Um, mm -hmm. And over the years, like I keep thinking it's just going to disappear. I keep thinking people are going to stop watching it. I think it's just going to be, but I still get, I still get a fair amount of uh, people contacted me on the Facebooks or the Instagrams telling me, Hey, I really loved your movie. And mm -hmm. Uh, even on Amazon, like you'll get, I'll check Amazon reviews, you know, and I'll get like one or two in a row sometimes, just horrible reviews like this. Right. You know, but I can't, if there was half a star that I could give it, I'd give it half, you know. And mm -hmm. then you'd get, you get somebody right after that, that just like really appreciates it for what it is. Because, you know, you, you, B movies have a special like quality to them that you either get it or you don't. And right. the thing that Starly, what, what, what landed for Starly was that it was, for those who can relate to the the subject matter and those who can appreciate what a what a film is without all the other hoo ha, um, its value, its intrinsic value, whatever that is, mm -hmm. uh, it seems to have it seems to have landed like pretty well with with some people. So I'm very, you know, I'm very proud that it's not um, that's still being watched. And uh, but it's it was a weird hybrid of a thing. Like you know, people didn't think you could mix weed and aliens together, but I saw. <laughs> I saw both as conduits, you know, into this right. universe that people are completely ignorant of mm -hmm. and tend to always judge. People always want to judge aliens. They want to judge marijuana. But if you really think about aliens and marijuana, you're mm -hmm. going into both those conversations already pre-biased by social conditioning. So you, do, you don't even have an opinion yet that you know of. You've been right. told your opinion on both those subjects your whole life. Right. Um, so I, I, I know, um, I know you somewhat. And I think Starleaf is perfect for you, right? Because it's it's weed, yeah. aliens, and spirituality, <laughs> right? Kind of all like wrapped together That's into this true. this one movie. Um, so yeah, I, I actually just started rewatching. I like. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. I like. You rewatched it? Oh. Yeah, I, I watched oh, it. Wow. <laughs> when it was first released on Prime, um, and then yeah. I forgot about it. And then obviously, you know, in preparation for this, I, I started to watch it again. Um, cool. Yeah, no, it's 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 really interesting. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to give a plug for that, you know, in, in the video here. I'll take um, in plugs. Yeah, get. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, but you had yeah. you had quite a journey, like getting to that point. Right. So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. like I didn't I didn't know until um, actually a, a few days ago that you were originally from Alabama right yeah, yeah. yeah so you so <laughs> I, I i went through and i started looking at at um your history and whatnot and you know found a, a few really interesting facts that mm -hmm. you know so i think we have a lot of in, uh, fun stuff to talk about um, oh yeah so yeah. in at some point you moved from from alabama to seattle we moved from alabama to california um because my dad my dad was in the navy and um well i'm my biological father, I don't know who he is, but my, my father that I was raised with, she, my mom met in a Tennessee bar mm -hmm. and he convinced her to move to San Diego. So I lived as a kid in San Diego. Okay. And then we went to, yeah, we went to Bremerton when I was like a teenager and I mm -hmm. spent the rest of my life mostly up in, yeah. And I've always had contact, you know, I'll go visit Alabama folks uh, occasionally. It's, it's not as common uh, as they'd like it to be, but, um, it's always weird because when I go down there, I always tell people, I've always told people this, that Alabama and the South is like a different country. Like it, it, it was at one point a different country. So right. you yeah. have to kind of make the adjustment when you're there uh, and kind of keep, and you know, I had a, um, I had an uncle tell me something and you know, we're white and, and he was like, uh, God damn, don't you bring that rap music down here, Richard. Don't you, don't you play that damn rap music. This is like 1991 or something. And he's like, this. <laughs> He's like, the fucking cops will pull us over, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they'll no, do that... shit to us that we don't want. To ha it, your skin ain't going to save you. Your skin color ain't going to save right. you. Right. 
Yeah, I, I, I lived yeah. in northern Idaho for, for a, a fairly large chunk of my adolescence. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, That's I... hard work, too. Yeah, shit. Especially back then. So it's a lot yeah. different now. You know, it people was... Don't, people don't realize that. Like, the, the kids today, I mean, they it's rough. But, like, when you were 20 years ago, like, there weren't any... Re, there was no recourse. If you got caught yeah. in a situation like that, it was going to get... It was going to get ugly. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I I didn't go back for quite some time. And I think when I was like 17 or 18, something like that, I, I finally decided it was time. I think it was 17. And I went back with, you know, like earrings and, you know, I probably had my hair dyed or whatever. <laughs> and I went to see a movie with my dad. And oh. we were standing in line, you know, outside. There was like one movie theater in the entire county, you know, like one of those sorts of oh, situations. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. we're standing in line and this kid about, you know, three people back, you know, looked up at his mom and said, mommy, is that guy a faggot? Oh my God. You know, it's like, holy shit. Like, <laughs> that's, what they th no, yeah. I had, a, I had my uncle's, uh, or my cousin called me up a couple years ago and was like, Rich, what you doing living up in Seattle with all them queer still? <laughs> it's what amazing. you doing? But can you send me some weed? Right. <laughs> and you're like, well, I mean, yes. I, yeah. Technically, I could, I could yeah, but yeah. you know, that's that's uh, yeah. yeah. But you know what? You know what scares people from Alabama, though? Mm. Um, Mississippi. People think Alabama's terrifying. The, the, I would say the single most terrifying state in the union is Mississippi, because uh, Mississippi is even darker uh, when it goes dark. It goes even darker in Mississippi. I was driving through Mississippi in 1993. Mm -hmm. and I pulled into a gas station, and I Love Lucy was playing on the TV. The the <laughs> fucking the fucking gas pumps were from the 60s. I thought I was mm -hmm. in a time warp. And right. I asked the guy, yeah, I asked the guy, where's the where's the bathroom? And he's out. Uh, it's out back. Uh, you ain't from around here, are you? Right. And I was like, no. And he's like, yeah, I knew that. Mm -hmm. And it was like, wow. Okay, so now where do we go with this conversation? Because I don't even know what we're talking about. And then I right. go out back. Yeah, I, dude, I'm not making this shit up. I go <laughs> <back>. Sure. <laughs> no, this is like real. Mm -hmm. And there's whites and colored bathrooms there. Fucking amazing. I'm amazing. not saying that they were operational in the way they used to be, but nobody had bothered to paint them over or board them up. It was like, wow. you know. And, and so when I saw that, this is going to sound a little harsh, but when I saw mm -hmm. that, I was like, it, it stopped being a history book lesson. It started being like, wow, there was at one point this massive infrastructure. And that's probably why these people are always broke because it costs money to fucking put bathrooms <laughs> up for everybody. Actually, that, that's really valid, man. Economics, man, just the economics alone of that is not smart to, to maintain right. your racist uh, standards because you're going right. to go broke. Right. I'm, and there's, there's the moral component, don't get me wrong, but like, uh, you know, I'm just like, God, sure. guys killing yourselves out here well, building it's, all. yeah it's sort of the uh the the, the racial version of of and i'm sorry the racial and the incorrect version of, of like the ada right it's yeah yeah, it's, yeah you know anyway yeah it was just freaky i mean uh so i i, I joke about i mean i love certain things about alabama I'll tell you what you throw anybody a football in alabama they're going to score a touchdown i mean if you right. like your football alabama mm -hmm. is like the sparta of football there's there's just if you ever watch 300 it's the same thing down there they fucking breed football players mm -hmm. and i'm built like a football player naturally yeah. so it's just something in the water or the corn i don't know what the grits mm -hmm. so and, and you'll get words of wisdom usually from the older ladies who have seen mm -hmm. it all like they they've seen enough they've had enough drunken ex-husbands and <laughs> right. they're just done you know they're done with all the bullshit so there's there's some beautiful things about the South, but uh, of course there's that dark side, and and mostly it comes down to just the fact that if you have a if you have any original opinions of your own, or you want to go against the grain, you're gonna pay the price for it if you if you you know if you don't fit in. So it's all about right. the South is all about fitting in, right? Either you fit in or you don't, and then yeah yeah you got to go if you don't fit in. So. That same town that I was telling, talking about, you know, with the uh, the movie theater, yeah. um, I went back, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 years later or something like that. And 
So after the, you know, the, the, the kid called me a faggot to my face, basically. Um, God. And wow. everything had changed so dramatically. I, I, I was kind of like almost like this, um, you know, hometown hero sort of person, like walking in there, right? Yeah, yeah. It was totally radically different than it was, you know, 10 or 15 yeah. years before. Yeah. Um, and I kind of liked it. Like, I, I brought out some friends from, from Manhattan, mm. and we were all like, every time a check would come, we were like fighting each other, like, oh, no, no, I have to pay for this, you know, because it was like, you know, a bunch of steaks and, you know, you know, lots of booze and whatever, and it would be like yeah. you know, forty six dollars. Yeah, I'm like fuck yeah, no, 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 no. I have to pay for this, right? Because this is going to be a story. I can go back and say like, yeah, I was in this this little town, and and you know, we got three steaks and like you know, eighteen oh. rounds of drinks or whatever yeah. for, for forty six yeah. bucks. That's the upside. That's a big upside. To yeah, it is. Little... It actually yeah. is. It's gorgeous um, too out there. Those places, especially Idaho, you've got. Oh yeah, mountains, trees. I mean, yeah, it's it's really, really super pretty. Yeah. Um. And again, like the majority of people who live there when I were when I was a kid are gone. You know, so it, it's it's people like from Seattle and and yeah. and whatnot who have moved to, you know, this little town and kind of stake their claim. So it's sort Alabama's of... changed a lot too. All the, a lot of the people from the bigger cities have moved in, and Hunts, yeah. Huntsville, which is near where I was born in Decatur, is a NASA. It's a NASA rocket science fucking lab. So mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, all those people pilfering out from there, all those, those, those great minds. And then, yeah, you know, I think things are, are getting a little bit better. Well, I thought they were. And then the right. capital riots. <laughs> that, right. <laughs> Let's save the politics because I, yeah. I think there's some, some other little jumping off points there. Yeah, um, totally. So you, you, you're born in Alabama, you end yeah. up in San Diego and now you're in Seattle. And at some point you become homeless what happened yeah yeah i mean i had a very um i had a very i had a very troubled youth you know i was not not a happy camper i had a, a mom who was a Jehovah witness had a dad who was a alcoholic drug addict and it just there was a lot of emotional physical abuse and yada 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 i think mm -hmm. when i got to about 21 i had run my course as far as like the the kid from this background and what was he going to do with his life you know and mm -hmm. um, i had gotten a job i lost a job i had a car breakdown I had a girlfriend breakup i got sick with something and then bam you know there's no resources there's no right. dad or mom writing checks for you so um i remember i was in bremerton and i had nowhere to go and i just was like fuck it i heard about this uh Alaskan boats that take people up to Alaska and you can make five grand doing that. Mm -hmm. And then there was the art Institute of Seattle, which I mm -hmm. thought, well, what if I just walk in there and say, look, I want to, I want to be an artist. Uh, what were they going to do? I had no idea. I just took a ferry. I literally walked on a ferry, no money with a backpack with whatever clothes I had. And I went to Seattle and uh, I failed the drug test for the Alaska boats because I had a <laughs> marijuana. I just smoked marijuana like a couple nights before because right. I'm living in a, I'm living in a shed in the woods and I have I need mm -hmm. I need some help, some hope. Um, yeah, but the Art Institute surprisingly, the counselor there was like, "Well, look, you know, you're so damn broke and destitute. The government might actually give you a couple grants. You just gotta fork out uh, about 800 bucks on your own." Mm -hmm. So I spent two maybe a month or two months working odd jobs homeless sleeping mm -hmm. on people's couches getting that money and then i got that money and then i got admitted into the art institute of seattle in 96 mm -hmm. i think yeah and then wow. i spent another month sleeping around on floors and train stations and shit and then eventually some kid saw me washing my clothes in the uh student like bathroom and he's like what's your what's your deal man like that's where your art supply is supposed to be. You get your underwear laying out in the sink here. This is really kind of odd. And, and I was like, dude, I got no place to live. And he's like, well, come mm -hmm. stay with me. Wow. So that changed my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was a really cool guy. He really got me introduced to, to being a normal person again, but that was a rough, everything about homeless people in terms of like why they get drunk, why they do drugs. I know why. <laughs> right. It's, yeah. yeah. Cause you're I mean, in a good place when you're there, you know, you're sad. Yeah. Yeah. I I've I've had a few um, times in my life where I've I've done the couch surfing thing. I've never been yeah. full on homeless, yeah. Um, but close enough that I yeah. was like, you know, no, there, there's I I'm not made for this shit. Like, there's no way. I'll tell you something really kind of awkward, but um, 
is what they said. I remember there were um, several people of color uh, who would like, they would do this. They would kind of joke around, like they were going to throw me a football pass. And they, they kept calling me quarterback. And mm -hmm. they were like, basically, they're like, what are you doing out here, man? You're like, why you've got, you look like you could be a quarterback back a football like what, do you, what the fuck's your problem like why do you what are you doing out here and it was really kind of sad because to them and their world they were like what are you you've got everything man and you're you're blowing it still somehow i don't know it was a weird uh, right. realization to have you know and um, yeah. yeah i don't i i have a lot of different opinions on it that over the but over the years the number one thing that i i think is that you know this country just doesn't have an infrastructure built around people it's built more around you know primarily making money for a very few group of people and right. i just think i know people get lazy There's, i wouldn't say people are lazy i think people get they get substance abuse issues because of whatever right and i don't think you should reward that but it's a very fine line between being a normal human being one day and having one two three or four other things come your way that are not in your control right and then you wind up on the street and trust me like when you're sleeping out in the wild and you don't know what's going to happen to you next mm -hmm. A couple of big beers, a couple of drugs oh, yeah. that that can ease your mind, and pretty soon that just spirals. You know, you just right. spiral. You know, so yeah, that wasn't that wasn't, and I've come close even since a couple of times. You know, so mm -hmm. I have this sort of problem where if you're an artist and you're trying to really survive as an artist, you're risking. <laughs> you're always mm -hmm. risking some kind of like danger, uh, in term financial danger. So. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, you know, I've just, I've just networked over the years and I've, I've learned a lot from that experience. I try to see humans for who they really are. And that keeps me a little bit able to be able to juggle the lifestyle that I live a little bit better. Um, definitely don't ever want to go through that again. I can tell yeah. you that right now. That was not no, fun. Hell no. Yeah. No, um, no bueno. Yeah. And it, it, you're right. It, as an artist, it, it's, it's really easy, you know, to do that. Um, I can always fall back on, on my software stuff, you know, if I need to. Yeah. Um, but, you know, as, as we get older, that becomes less and less likely to. That's right? the thing that's starting to bother me now. I'm starting to realize, holy shit, I'm about to age out of everything. Yeah. Like exactly. I'm at a point where, yeah, I'm at a point where no one's going to, they're going to see my age. They're going to be like, well, we'll start with a little younger with somebody else. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Exactly. So now um, I'm like, man, I better make sure all this freelance shit that I'm doing, uh, pays off and get some residual income streams or whatever the hell it is. People mm -hmm. work remotely, whatever you do, so you, you know, I got to do, or we got to do, but yeah, the ageism thing, man, all of a sudden I'm in that, I'm in that conversation now. I'm like, yeah. Oh my God, fuck. yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> uh, you know, my industry especially is tends to be a, a fairly young industry, you know, and there's a reason behind it, you mm -hmm. know, cause you can't work 85 hours a week when you're, you know, when you're getting a little bit older. Um, yeah, yeah. I still do it every once in a while, but it, it's, you know, I have to recover for like three weeks after doing a week of that. Yeah. That's the tough thing. I worked at Microsoft for a little bit and um, I remember that expectation, but I think it's gotten worse because people's lives, we, that was, I worked at Microsoft before cell phones were re really even that popular. So I can't imagine right. now when you got a smartphone and people, I know that I worked as an Uber driver in Seattle and I remember like Amazon people would get in a car and then I'd have to take them right back home because they would get a text. And if they didn't jump on their computer within like five, 10 minutes, mm -hmm. they were going to get some kind of like reprimand or, or something. You oh, know? Absolutely. Yeah. Amazon is a brutal, brutal working environment. I had people crying in the car. Right. Oh, I'm sure. Just breaking down. I remember this, this, uh, I think she was a Chinese national. She just got in a car and she just said tears. And she's like, I hate my job. And I'm like, yeah. and I just picked it up from Amazon. I'm like, Oh mm -hmm. man, they broke you. Huh? Wow. Yeah. Fuck. No shit. Um, there are a couple groups within the organization that aren't that bad, but um, yeah, I yeah, heard that too. I heard that too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I actually have turned down jobs at Amazon just because I refuse. You know, I the would. money is incredible, yeah. but it just I, I can't do it. You I'm know? trying to find little remote. I mean, I still do. I don't do software development, but I do like uh, I do videography, editing, photography, stuff like that. And I try to get remote gigs whenever I can, and that are high paying. And you just try to tuck away that money, right? Work on the other thing, but uh, nothing pays as well as fucking software. No, I mean, no, no. and it's it's so easy, you know. It's like you can just go out and like, yeah. hey, I need I need three or four grand, whatever. I'll just take yeah. my contract and 
you know, yeah, yeah. work, you know, three days and make it. So I know, I know. I wonder if I should start doing it again as a, if it's a, if it's something you can get in and out of, you know, I don't want to get stuck in that commitment for like a year and mm -hmm. destroy my body and my mind, right. you know, just hammering right. away at that stuff. But at least you have that as a fallback. Kind of. Yeah. It gets harder, you know, every year. <sighs> yeah. Um, I don't know. So let's, let's get, let's get back to Starleaf a little bit yeah. because again, it, it's, it's really interesting. So, and I, I, I know where you filmed it. So I, you do I, know. I know that. Yeah, I do. That's right. You do know. I, I know that backyard really well. So, um, oh, and that's it's, funny. it's really funny. I was watching it with my girlfriend and, and, um, she's like, oh, yeah, I forgot. She said something about the scenery or whatnot. And I was like, oh, yeah, I know that place. I'm just like, well, how, how would you know? I was like, it's a long story. <laughs> you know, uh, I, know. I, I know the person whose, who's, you know, backyard was, was oh, used for this. And, but it doesn't look like that backyard at all. Like, you know, you did a, you did a really good job. Yeah. I found little cheats. You know, the thing about the thing about the Northwest is that one, one evergreen tree here looks the same as any evergreen tree or anywhere else. <laughs> That's true. So you, just, you know, you just gotta, you just gotta, well, the cool thing was she lives in, uh, I don't know if we want to talk about who it is, but yeah. Yeah. Paul's the person. Home? Paulsbo, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Where I filmed it was in Paulsbo, people, which people <laughs> laugh at that, but Paulsbo is gorgeous, it. actually. It's yeah. beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, um, so we did next to all these logging roads. I would just drive down a logging yeah. road and go, this looks like a good spot to film a scene. Mm -hmm. And then we would just augment that shot yeah. with whatever I had in the back. And I built like a couple sets. I built like that treehouse log mm -hmm. shelter thing. And I chopped down some of our trees and uh, which she liked clearing land. So, right. <laughs> so, you know kill two birds with one stone right yeah the only downside is that we we started that thing started a fire uh we were we were doing oh, a no. test burn yeah we're doing a test burn in there to get rid of the mold and the, just kind of burn out the inside a little bit so the actors would be a little bit more comfortable and the thing caught fire mm -hmm. the freaking set caught fire and oh wow we had bottled waters we were trying to put out the fire <laughs> god yeah that sounds horrifying the funniest thing was that damn Prius. I got so much mileage out of that Prius. That Prius became like the, the movie hero car. And I love it. I don't know. <laughs> I took that thing for buying. People, people undervalue Priuses, man. That that mm -hmm. I think it's front wheel drive. Um, and I don't know. Like I drove that Prius all over logging roads and and Paul's bow mm -hmm. and watched it and people and I never got stuck. I took it down yeah. some fucking dangerous roads man no one yeah. yeah i mean you can easily get lost in that part of uh washington right i mean yeah you can it's like there's a bunch of houses and then there's nothing yeah you know you're in the middle of nowhere but yeah you're only you know 30 miles away from seattle so right it's just it's just the uh, one thing i'll give the northwest nothing nothing beats the northwest in terms of the the beauty like the yeah it's phenomenal. I guess, I mean, I LA has been nice, but LA is pretty, pretty dry, you know, so you just don't get that lush greenery, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So that was the nice thing about, you know, Hey, can I take a quick bathroom break? Of course. Yeah. Sorry. Just... I've been drinking a lot. Of water. Hey, no problem, man. One of the big problems I have living in LA is I can't get enough water. The the dry heat or whatever it is is just super dehydrating. So oh, absolutely. But um, yeah, Sorry. I, I lived there in the uh, the early '90s, and oh. uh, 
That's a good time not, to live in LA, probably. I bet it was actually. It was. Yeah. I think it was ninety, ninety or ninety one. Yeah. Too. Um, yeah. But I lived in Burbank, and Burbank had like literally nothing at that time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they had. The, it still doesn't have that much. It's got a big mall now. Though. That was it's it. Yeah. They had the it's mall. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> there was like one record store that was kind of close to the mall, and that was about it. Oh, record stores. I, dr- I drive by on Sunset, the uh, I guess the original Tower Records. I love that store. Or I used to love the store, I guess. Yeah. You used to go there? Um, yeah, that, absolutely. Um, That's awesome. Now there's a, um, what's the name of the, the, the big store? And they actually just closed last year, too. Oh. Uh, I'll think of it. But it's yeah, it's yeah. like the most, it, it's like record store mecca right like they had everything imaginable right yeah. and so basically every time uh or almost every time a, a you know a big touring band would come through they'd, they'd take like an exodus to go to the store and i wish i could think of the name oh, that's pretty cool um yeah. it's it's fairly close to to the rainbow and i'm, I'm trying to remember oh. exactly where it is but oh. yeah i like that little section of LA. i drive through oh, it every yeah. now and then check out all the yeah. it's all closed right now but it's still kind yeah. of a, it's still a cool place yeah i I'm more partial probably to um, like there's a like a seven block stretch of Hollywood Boulevard that I love. So, oh, which one is that? Um, mm-hmm. I always stay at the Roosevelt. Oh, okay. And then uh, almost always, and then um, like seven blocks down on Cherokee is uh, Bordner's, and I love Bordner's. It's one of the one of the best bars in the world, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, I'll look for um, it. You should, yeah. and I don't know if you smoke or not, but they actually have um, their grandfathered in. Them and the Rainbow both are, are grandfathered in for smoking in a covered outside area. Oh, right. Okay. So, just in case, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I sometimes get comforted by smokers because it just. Rem- I mean, I don't smoke, but it smoking reminds me of those days when you would go see shows. You'd see go see a rock show. And you'd be hanging out and like, okay, one thing I'll give cigarettes, I mean, they might give you cancer, but they, they also are probably the single greatest tool people have used over the years to instigate uh, any kind of social interaction. So like, sure. They're very, they're useful in that sense, I think, you know, mm-hmm. and that's, that's one thing I've always liked about the French and the Vietnamese. They just, they're just smoking and drinking coffee all day long, but mm-hmm. you know, that's how they get, that's how you get to know you, you know, that's how you get to know people uh, as well. So I well, know. there's the, the reverse of that too, because now with smoking bans and whatnot, mm. um, my being a smoker can help me excuse myself from things like, you know, conversation goes <laughs> sideways or whatever, you know, it's like, Oh, I got to go have a smoke. That's you know? true. And so I can, oh, you know, and hopefully the other person isn't a smoker or whatever, you know, so they yeah, yeah. Out, but <laughs> That's smart, man. Everybody, everybody, everybody needs to get out of jail free. Everybody needs a way to get out when they need definitely. To. Yeah. And then there's you also know. the uh, phone call. Oh like yeah, the fake phone call. It's like, the oh, fake... I got to take this call. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do that all the time. I um, got two checks up your sleeve. You can always default to one of those. Yeah, you need. exactly, exactly. Or even better, both. Right there, you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> absolutely. All right, Richard, we haven't talked a lot about you yet, so we, we kind of have oh, to get okay. into that. Okay. Um, we, we talked about Starleaf a little bit, but um, obviously one of the one of the big parts of Starleaf is, well, weed, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you actually created a, uh, um, a weed brand or a can- cannabis brand. Like, yeah. I don't like to say the word cannabis. I, I feel like I'm being pretentious when I say sure, that. I mean, sure. it's fucking weed. Yeah. you know um yeah but you know if you want to piss off um a, a retail worker in 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 uh, seattle call yeah. it weed i mean they get yeah. they get really really upset what um, happened is all these people that were in the black market for so many years dodging the popo um they had to, they had to get legitimate within like a year frame they had to they right. had to finally use all this new vernacular they had to use all these new processes and of course none of that really worked that great um, all of it was kind of flawed, very from the get go in terms of how the state was running. It. I mean, they did what they could, but it was just like a shit show in a lot of ways. And so we were caught in the middle of all that, trying to negotiate this uh, this idea of having a film and having a weed brand. And you know, to be honest, we pulled it off. We did a pretty damn good job. The only 
the biggest issue is that we had a crop failure. One of the, one of the growers that we were um, growing with had a major greenhouse incident where they lost power or something for like a couple of days. And so they lost all these crops that were going to go. Oh man. Yeah. And so the big store in Tacoma, there was a big store in Tacoma. I'm forgetting what they're called now, but they were our chief. They were the main retail outlet for cannabis uh, for Starleaf. And if they couldn't get a steady supply because they were selling it off the shelf, they were like, we can't keep you on the shelf. So we lost that little window. Oh man. Because Yeah. I mean, you know, like for me, it's all kind of crazy. Like I just came up with this random idea and I had all these like, I had all these like altruistic visions and stuff of how I was going to save the world. But um, what was, what's very interesting about Starleaf, I will tell people this, if you have something that's inspired, it, it comes to you organically and you can get a, a momentum going. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do pretty impossible things. It can really happen, but you're going to have to also juggle the things that don't work out. Right. But when I look back at all this, there was definitely like an energy coming from the cosmos somewhere mm -hmm. that I rode along with a lot of other people and we, we got it out. It landed wherever it lands and now it's, it's whatever. But I think it did really help a lot of people. I think the weed helped people. Um, mm -hmm. I think the movie helped like a lot of vets would come up to me after screenings and tell me, Hey man, thanks for, even though this is a B film and it's not supposed to be mm -hmm. taken seriously. Um, they would still feel some impact from the artistry that me and everybody else had organized. And I'll tell you a little story. Uh, I, again, I wrote the script with Hugh Berry um, mm -hmm. and he's, I think he's in Seattle still. And I took the idea down to a guy that I know smokes weed. Uh, <laughs> he owns a, uh, he owns a coffee shop that I would always go to. And I said, Hey man, do you think you might be a, a you know, think you might want to donate be an investor? <laughs> I love and it. He's like, <laughs> he's like, nah, man, my margins are too low, but uh, check this out. A guy just came here the day before wanting to buy my place to grow a weed farm. Wow. Yeah. I'm like, really? Well, I'm making a movie about a weed and I need weed to be in the movie. Actually, mm -hmm. I think I had gone to him to get a weed plant and he's like, no, this guy's got a bunch. So that was a very serendipitous thing, right? Like how, what are the odds of just that day? And so I contacted that guy who was a Japanese guy and he's the, he gave us all of our plants for the movie. And he was the one we partnered with later to get the weed string up and running. We had the switch partners later, but yeah, I just got, I mean, I wasn't even really a smoker before then. I just, I just understood the value of what the plant offered. And my brother had, had gone back from Iraq with PTSD and I was trying mm -hmm. to get him some help. And, uh, weed was the one thing that was keeping him from, you know, doing this, right. Well, not, to be, not to be dramatic, but like he literally was at that point. So anyway, you know, I rode, I sort of rode, I think the karmic wave that was going on in my life at the time with the other people involved. And, mm -hmm. you know, we landed somewhere that I think was, I'm happy with, you know, I, yeah. I tried to get in a sequel made, but you know, uh, you know, you're dealing with like, I, I get people in the weed business who primarily see weed as weed. You don't, you, you don't sure. need a movie to smoke weed. You can just smoke weed and be, live a great life. So right. uh, <laughs> trying to combine all of that, you know, quote unquote, grassroots effort uh, over the long haul just was, it, it worked out pretty well, but we kept having little, just little snags like weed, mm -hmm. growing weed and selling weed is already one of the hardest things on this planet to do with all the legal framework that you got to go through in, mm -hmm. in the state of Washington. So you got so many, your margins are like this. So trying right. to get money from them was really just like, they had, they had to support themselves and their business more than they could fund another film. So right. we'll see what happens. I mean, I, I still get interest. It's just making movies ain't cheap, you know? No, no, it's not. not a cheap it's enterprise. not. Yeah. What, if, if I can ask, what was your budget for Starly? Um, I think I can say it now. It, it, wound up getting to like around forty thousand dollars i think oh, that's, that's not bad at all no and we've gotten i think the majority of that back from just you know sales to itunes and mm -hmm. i think amazon still pays us pretty good occasionally mm -hmm. and we got a bunch of other little apps that that run it to be mm -hmm. uh the thing about starleaf though here's the interesting thing we actually were on the road to making some real money off of it um mm -hmm. the we took it to the American film market and we were getting, we had two countries right away buy it. Australia, I think Germany bought it. They didn't give us a lot of money, but the theory goes, if you take a low budget film that you say you shoot for under 50 K and then you bring mm -hmm. it to the film market, you can 
piecemeal it out to different countries around the world for a couple grand or five sure. grand. Yeah. And then if you get enough Bulgaria, Hungary, Italy, buy your film, then all of a sudden you've got a hundred thousand dollars and maybe 200. Right. The problem was the weed. The, I, I never thought that would be an issue, but like a lot of these countries were, wanted to buy the film and they were like, yeah, we can't broadcast anything about cannabis on our, um, networks and here in Paraguay um, uh, because we're going to get they're, the conservatives are going to come down on us so right. I fucked my own best <laughs> idea <laughs> they had me redesign the cover so many times like get rid of all the weed on the cover try to like make, right. make it's not about weed I'm like well it's going to be about weed eventually right. Right? I mean it's kind of a, a major plot element right <laughs> I mean like basically yeah. the entire movie is about weed so yeah I mean, you can't get you around that right so that was that was a, a, learning, a learning lesson in how business really works in the world but mm -hmm. you know again at the end of the day if I if I got some people to enjoy the film if I've got them to be moved by it, it's a b film if they're being moved by a b film right. excellent day that's incredible yeah, yeah you know incredible. I mean it's I met a lot of great people on that set. Uh, I'm still talking to most of them. Uh, Russell Hodgkinson, who was on Z Nation, he's he lives in Seattle. He was my neighbor for a little bit in West Seattle, and mm -hmm. uh, him and I still talk. So, yeah, I mean, it was. I learned a lot about what it takes to make an independent film, and it's brutal. You know, it's a brutal experience with mm -hmm. not a lot of glory, or not. It doesn't have a lot of um, people. How do I say it? Like people expect you. They expect things to be a certain way. They expect it to go easy. They expect this to just work out or they expect these laws of filmmaking to apply at all times. And they just, they're just, there were just days when I literally had to just point the camera and start shooting and try to get whatever I could get because I had no idea what other thing was gonna go wrong, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, you, you just have to make it work, so. Yeah, yeah so. You know, one, th one thing that I'm learning about all of this stuff, I, I just started getting into like video stuff and whatnot. Mm. Um, it was the one thing I had never done in terms of technology, right? So I was like, okay, I'm gonna tackle this. Yeah. Um, and I'm still not very good at it, but mm. what I learned is the the absolute tediousness of, of editing video. It's so tedious, yeah. Oh, man. It's by, it's frame, it comes down to each frame. Like you, yeah. you rough, edit and then you but then the game is like the micro edits like trying to make sure right. that they all hold up yeah and you're always yeah. going back going oh my god like how do i make this tighter how do i hide this performance flaw you know how do i hide this issue with the boom operator sticking his boom pole in it or something you know it's, mm -hmm. yeah it's absolutely. a lot of work i mean yeah. like i said i'm not very good at it so you know for me it's the fade in fade out like i use yeah. that all the time just like okay you know Oldie, it, good. What's that? An oldie but a goodie. The old yeah, exactly, oh, yeah. exactly. Um, you know, and, and I just try to make the cuts kind of yeah. look okay. Yeah. You know, I mean, to, to be honest, like you know, what I do is is primarily you know oral rather than than you know visual. Mm. So you know, I post the videos just because I think they're kind of interesting. But really, it's it's just more about the talking. Yeah. You know. Well, that's the content. I mean, the content is, if the content's engaging to somebody, then you know, one thing about film is that the audiences will forgive image quality more than they'll forgive audio quality. They don't mm -hmm. have good audio. They don't, they don't want to sit through it. They'll sit through. We've seen so many YouTube videos now that were badly shot, but entertaining that people are kind of open to, you know, that, but they don't want right. to hear a screechy audio track. They don't want to hear unbalanced audio. That's, that's the one thing that, I still struggle with that more than I struggle with the image quality. Like that's mm -hmm. still a tricky thing for me, but I'm well, learning. It's also, you know, kind of getting back to the, the age thing. It's, mm -hmm. it's really weird because you have kids who are like, you know, 13 who are creating like videos that would have been amazing 20 years ago. <laughs> you know, I just, yeah, that gets me. That gets me. Cause like I saw a video the other day that some guy shot on YouTube. Uh, he posted to YouTube and he, uh, he shot on like a red camera, it's super high quality, 8K or some shit. And I'm like, my God, this is like better than some of the feature films shot in the 80s, you know, mm -hmm. this is better than those canon movies that they were popular. In a, and, it, you know, but then they have no context. You're right. They don't have any context for like how good. So the only thing you offer then, I think as an artist, the only thing that I even bother telling myself anymore, because I cannot compete with these kids and their demo reels 
that looks so nice is that hopefully what I'm giving to the world is unique and original enough to be to stand on its own for that for the merits of that alone. And right. the the quality is just there to make sure it doesn't you know drop off to something that's right. unwatchable. You know, but yeah, you can't. The only thing that comes with age that's that's I think of any use right now to me is uh, is to not giving a shit anymore what I say. <laughs> right. no, absolutely, a huge asset. Yeah, and you know, just like having gotten to a point in life where I, I've seen enough, I've had enough personal experiences where I can I think I can elucidate certain topics pretty well for people mm -hmm. that are in the same boat who don't have the time to figure it out themselves, and that's that's right. a good thing. You know, that's something that a fifteen year old can't do yet. <laughs> <laughs> they can make me look bad in, in the video world, but they, they're not going to, they're not going to be able to deal with like, uh, you know, uh, how many UFOs have they seen? You know what I right. mean? Hey, that, that's a great segue. Thank you for that. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. That's um, really UFOs. yeah. I mean, aliens, man. Oh, um, <clears throat> do you think we're, we're, well, I'm okay. Let, let me rephrase this. We obviously have been being fed information that yeah. is is moving towards a disclosure yeah yeah um and in fact i think there has been disclosure it's just been subtle enough that most people don't get it right um what do you think do you think we're going to have some some big event where it's like disclosure right mm -hmm. like there are aliens and maybe here's a picture mm -hmm. or a video right do you think yeah. we're going to get to that point or do you think it's going to be the slow feeding of information it's man, it's such a that the alien thing is such a huge subject to cover because um, there's layers to it that are that are tricky. Um, I think what's happened with the U.S. government, if you just want to talk about it from the U.S. government point of view, is they got to a point where technology overran their ability to hedge against telling the truth, simply because fighter pilots have cell phones now when they're flying, and. You can only, if it's the 1950s and the 1960s, you've got that central control over the press. You've got that, um, like with Roswell, like everybody at Roswell was told by the military that do your job, shut up. We just beat, we, we just beat the Nazis thanks to you guys being so well behaved. So, right. you know, if we're going to win the Cold War, you need to keep doing. So all of those psychogenic factors really played the biggest part in suppressing information uh, for the longest time, plus all mm -hmm. the effort that the government put into just creating such a stigma around it that it became socially untenable to even talk about the subject, which people, mm -hmm. which I want to get to in a second, is the number one problem with everything related to UFOs. Mm -hmm. It's even more so than, quote unquote, not having evidence because there's plenty of evidence now. It's just that people people don't understand how much social conditioning influences your ability to perceive reality accurately like people it's just a, it's a fundamental law of physics i think you know mm -hmm. that social bias cognitive leads to cognitive disassociation and that's because really like so again back to the government i mean they got to a point where there was just too many incidents happening with too many accredited let's say qualified people to where they mm -hmm. couldn't they couldn't just keep shutting it down so they're going to have to come up with some solution to that. But I think they're really just sort of relying on the fact that most humans now are so easily distracted and emotionally um, able to be maneuvered to, to, to maybe hedge on the fact that maybe we won't care or maybe we won't, it won't have the impact because the truth is going to have to come out, which is that they have known for a long time that the ecology of earth is not limited to what we think it is. And they've, I think they've been benefiting from it in very unsavory ways for the most part. And Ooh, um, I want to dive into that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have a whole theology built around what I think the human race is and all that shit, which we'll get into. But as far as what you're wow. saying, this is going to be in, fun. In three months, they say they're going to release an official document because it was much as people right. hate Rubio and these other guys, for some reason, they got to stick up their ass. It said, Hey, we got to start getting some real data now, whether or not they'll really get it. I just don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised if we got something a lot more, mm -hmm. you know, convincing for most for your average person and then, right. you know, take it from there. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've always believed it. It's, it's real. I mean, yeah. I had, when I was like 12, maybe 12, 11, 12, somewhere in there um, in Northern Idaho. Um, I was out with a, a friend of mine. We're just doing what you do in the middle of nowhere, which is like, you know, walking 
right? Like that was a big thing. Yeah. Um, probably like, you know, a big plug of Copenhagen in my lip or whatever. But anyway, so we, we were out, you know, like doing this stuff and I looked up in the sky and I was like, oh, fuck, that's not a plane. You know, like I remember saying that oh, wow. and I turned to my friend and I was like, there's something, you know, there's not something right about this. Oh, and wow. so we started running, like kind of like trying to chase after and figure out where this thing was going. Mm. Um, and it was late. I think we, we had to be home at like eight or whatever. So we stopped and I remember I went home and I told my mom about it. Like, this is, you know, this is crazy shit that I just saw. Um, and she, my mom basically said, do you need to call the police? And I was like, well, then I'm not going to call the police and say, I, I think I saw a UFO, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> especially in a, a small little town, because even at that age, I was like, yeah. okay, well, that's yeah. not going to go over well. Yeah. Anyway, so the next day, um, the same friend and I went to where we thought we saw it, like, disappear. And had to hike up, you know, where I grew up was, you know, full of, of mountains and whatnot. So we had to like hike like halfway up this mountain. Yeah. And sure enough, like towards the very top of the mountain, there was this entire area where all the trees were just like, you know, decimated. Are you serious? I'm dead serious. And it was, it freaked wow. me the fuck out. Yeah. Dude, you got, so you, wow, that's an awesome correlation. Yeah. It looked like uh, Tunguska, right? I mean, it was right. literally just all the trees like laid on their sides. Yeah. Yeah. And there was a burn, huge burn mark, like right Wasn't there. Wasn't really. Yeah. Yeah. You got a good one. So, but again, you know, I mean, I, I don't know because there was no access to, to you know, social media or, or you know, sure. real-time yeah, news or anything like that. Right, right. Um, it could have been a helicopter crash for all I know. But it, I, I don't think it was, yeah. you know? Um, and that's that's a memory that's always stuck with me. I mean, it was it was. Um, yeah, yeah, that's legit, man. That's a that's a legit yeah. experience, and that's so many many people have these, and mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, I started having some very strange experiences when I turned twenty nine that have put me on the path that I am now. And UFOs are just sort of one one component of it. But the biggest thing that I think you know is people just don't respect how much, how much of their uh, life experience is, is controlled by their need to be socially normal. Mm -hmm. if, 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 and this, that's been a tactic, that in turn is a tactic used by a lot of forces more powerful than we are to try sure. to keep us from walking to the front door and going, of course, this shit's all real. Well, we're in a position where we, we need to figure out our proper relationship to it so that we know, you know, where, where does our sovereignty end or begin in relation? And if you're not having that, if you're the government and you're not letting people have that conversation, then you must have, then you have to start reading into it and you're, and you should read into it. I have friends who I don't see any evidence for it. I'm like, dude, there's so much fucking evidence for it. Like the evidence is overwhelming. The problem is you have an emotional block that says, I don't even want to talk about this subject because if I do, I'm risking actual pretty negative repercussions in terms of what it could happen to your job, your sure. social standing. That's a real fucking thing. That's, that's a real, that's like a militarized um, way of, of trying to enforce a reality, you know, it's just like dominating it from, from the get go. And, you know, I don't know any species that's dealing with what we're dealing with right now, has the amount of evidence it does to suggest that the local ecology is a lot more expanded than they think it is. I think it'd be within our best interest to try to figure out exactly, you know, what's going on. And, um, you know, I'm trying to figure it out because I have my personal experiences too. And then the more I uncover, the more I kind of go, Oh, this is interesting. Like, um, we can get into that, but like, I, yeah, no, I, I'd love to. Well, I think, okay. So I think what it comes down to is this, <laughs> um, but actually, Bob Lazar, you've heard of Bob Lazar, right? Of course. Okay. Yeah. So one thing that's always left out of the Bob Lazar conversations is it's something he talked about in his Netflix documentary when he mm -hmm. said he was looking through one of the books that apparently these aliens had, um, which I'm surprised aliens have books, but whatever. That's what part of his story. <laughs> sure. uh, the problem, the, the thing that never gets talked about is that in his discussion, he talked about how the aliens referred to humans as containers. That mm. was their word for us. Right. Okay. And so that's interesting because that kind of lines up with 
my theories over the years that I've come up with uh, based on reading a lot of the accounts of the Anunnaki, um, the Archon theory from the Greeks. Um, I'm at a point, I think, this is how I'll lay it all out. I'll just, I'll just shut up and lay it all out. I Do think it. humans, I think humans are a little bit confused. We, we have this idea about physical reality being one thing when it's really more of like just a layer of a, a bigger ecology. Mm-hmm. And we're trapped, I think, through both physical and emotional abuse to stay within a small spectrum of reality, this uh, five sense primary reality. And I think that's been engineered to some degree by these forces. Mm-hmm. And by staying in that area, we're not able to perceive what's happening in these other realms and thereby we can be taken advantage of. It's kind of like chickens. Do chickens know who's stealing their eggs at night? Do chickens know when they wake up in the morning, their eggs aren't there? Are they cognitively able to process what's happened? And I think that's the problem with human beings. We, we At one point we must have been, I think, higher. This might've been why we had ancient civilizations that we can't figure out how they how they worked. I think we were at a higher level at one point and that fall, the fall motif that we see throughout history, some point something came in and de- downgraded our ability. To, we went from satellite radio to AM radio and we don't have the perception that we used to have. We, we only see it on the fringes and we only see, we catch glimpses of it. And I think we're frequency deprived to the point where, you know, we can be taken advantage of, uh, and these mm-hmm. are the layers of reality that these other, and we see examples of the trans dimensional physics that we see with these other mm-hmm. UFOs. And I don't think they're all bad, but I think, I think the U S government has definitely probably been, you know, working with, or, or is in line with some of that stuff that is negative. And I feel like, you know, we are getting to that crucial point where we've got to, we're going we're gonna to jump up a layer or two, mm-hmm. get some more information about what's going on and whether or not I think a lot of people can handle it. It's going to be the question because it's going to be a, um, if you've lived in this world for a while, you've had these experiences, you can kind of acclimate a little bit better. But I think from a religious point of view, uh, politics right. point of view, this is going to be tough when humans realize that, um, I mean, I think humans are infinite consciousness having a temporal existence, the physical body is the container, but if that container has been tweaked and we're not accessing our full potential because our embodiment is being a bit obfuscated or intruded upon, then I don't know. You know, it says a lot about the stakes of uh, our lives. I don't know. I don't know. That makes so, a lot of sense. No, it does actually. So, um, I kind of have a theory of my own, but it, it, it ties into, you know, um, quantum suicide slash, you know, s- simulation theory. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I don't want to get too deep into it because honestly, I don't need to be committed. Um, <laughs> but, but I, I think, I think there's, um, I think there definitely are aliens. I don't think they are what we think they are. Mm-hmm. I don't think we are what we think we are. That's I agree I think, with that too. Yeah, yeah. There, there's an entire weird world outside of where we are. Right. Right. That nobody yeah. understands. I mean, you can understand it. It and, seems. The, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and I, I think we're starting to understand it a little bit more and more, or at least we think we're understanding it, which could yeah. also be part of the simulation, um, because we're creating our own simulations. Right. So we're, we're, yeah. we're starting to get closer and closer to that point. Yeah. Um, the, the Greeks had um, the, I mean, the, so the idea of having a nemesis of having something working as an antagonist can actually further your development. And in some ways, you know, like the simulation theory to me um, and I, I, I don't, you know, listen, David Icke has gotten kind of controversial over the years. Yes, he's, yes, he has. He's, he's kind of into the whole coronavirus is caused by 5g thing, which, I have my issues with 5G, but I don't think that's happening. Right. Um, over, but the one fundamental thing that, and again, this is another problem people have, is like you don't have to like, if you say that you listen to so-and-so and then this other person over here, it doesn't mean you have to take in everything that they say. Right. You, this is, there's a line from Inglorious Bastards, uh, mm-hmm. which is the best line I've ever seen in a film or heard in a film. And it is, facts can be misleading, but rumors are always revealing because everybody lies. All your right. friends lie, your parents lied, your God lies. Sometimes they lie for a good reason. <laughs> maybe, 
maybe the rumors that are there are, are not so much about believing, but like trying to figure out what's the play that everybody's right. caught in, you know, what's the bigger play and people want to be, a lot of people want to be followers. They want to just follow the rules and they want everything to be okay. And there are sociopaths out there and every creed right. who love that about us. They love the fact that that's a default for like 90% of the population. So it's very easy for any, whether it's chickens or dogs or animals or humans mm -hmm. to get caught in the social and emotional uh, psychopathic sort of scenarios that trap them from ever figuring out what's their for their own good. And so mm -hmm. I look at all of this as like something has happened to humans where the, the, the real game, which is our, which is maybe more of our emotional and spiritual and meaningful lives. What, mm -hmm. what, what's meaningful to us has been obfuscated so that we're trapped in like these patterns of just trauma. And because I think trauma, I mean, I know it sounds crazy, but I believe trauma is an energy that gets siphoned mm -hmm. off into this other universe that these creatures live in. And is used as fuel because they're not able to connect to what our source life is coming from anymore. I mean, that's my theory on it. That it's wow. the, um, okay. Yeah, it's like the it's like the Matrix basically. You know, where our right. our souls are batteries basically for for creatures who don't have souls or don't have access to what people call the divine, or let's just call it source consciousness. They don't have mm -hmm. that same access to it because of their karmic. And again, I think aliens can be everything from physical aliens to metaphysical, or let's say let's say energetic. They don't have a sentience that doesn't require a physical vehicle. Would, um, you know, sorry to interrupt, but, but would yeah, you yeah. equate things like you know ghosts or apparitions in in the same sort of way? Like, would you consider them aliens? I guess in your cosmology. Yeah. Here's my thing. I've had way more experience having paranormal encounters with people, what people call ghosts or demons, than I have an mm -hmm. alien. I've only had a couple of. I've seen. I've had several UFO experiences. Uh, my only contact with quote unquote aliens has been when I've been in the astral out of body experience world, which some people might blow that off as being right. nothing, but the paranormal stuff has actually been in like waking states where I haven't been on drugs and I haven't been, uh, I'm not asleep. So um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, you know, it's such a, it's such a big ecology. You know, I just, sure. I just look at it like there's probably extraterrestrials that are physical there's probably extraterrestrials that would fit more into what we would call like the angel category or the higher being category. They don't, they don't have a physical body. Mm -hmm. And then I think, I think that there's a layer of bad people, <laughs> bad actors mm -hmm. uh, that might be both physical, but maybe primarily metaphysical that exist right between us and the next higher level. And they call this like the 4d, the astral world, the dream world, the place you mm -hmm. go when you die. I feel like there's a whole segment of like parasitic creatures that have created like this simulation that have created this matrix that don't want humans to ascend back to that original state that we might've been in, you know, our bodies and our minds were capable of producing these greater civilizations. I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's my general operating theory based on what I've right. experienced in with these discarnate personalities, because the ones I've encountered have been very hateful and I've been very uh, focused on creating fear and everything that I've seen come from my research and my personal experience has told me that that's that agenda is to keep us they can access the physical the same way but they can take from our byproducts in the physical what they need to continue being who they are and and, right. and maybe in some greater cosmic world all of this is what it takes to 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 ascend uh, I don't know I philosophically I don't I don't get too far down that road because the primary issues right now are just like, how do we, how do we get out of the mess we're in and get to the truth and not self-destruct? Because I think when you go up against religious upbringing, when you go up against people's political biases, look what happened mm -hmm. recently. Look what's going on right now. You start dropping like physical, like you start dropping aliens, you start dropping spiritual concepts on people that they're not ready for. I don't know. Like I had a, I had a huge struggle in the early first 10 years of dealing with this shit. Like I right. had all kinds of meltdowns over it. So, you know, I don't so, know. Richard, I mean, Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. No, no, no. I, I like getting into this shit. I just, <laughs> I, I want to make a point here. I mean, to, to most people, if not a vast majority of people, what you just said sounds like fucking batshit crazy. Yeah. Whatever. It won't be for long. I can tell them that. Well, good. Good. Yeah. So 
my my question has to do with when you first started going through that that mm -hmm. kind of realization yeah um did you think that what you were thinking was crazy did i took myself into the psych ward really well, I took myself into the ER. Yeah, I had an experience where I went I went down to the ER at Virginia Mason in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I said, I, something's, something's not right. I'm chanting some strange language that I don't know how to speak. I wake up at night doing these strange uh, hand symbol stuff. I don't know what's going on with me. And um, they were like, you know what? Yeah, yeah, it's it's called a Kundalini awakening, which we'll, we'll get into. Mm -hmm. But but they were like, well, if you're not trying to kill yourself or anybody else, we need to get you out of here because this bed, we got people coming off the street that need this bed so right yeah i just had to like on my own kind of figure it out i went and got a guru i found a guru in north seattle oh hold on a second i went and found i went and found a guru who kind of helped me in the early stages of what they call a kundalini awakening um mm -hmm. and yeah you know but yeah most people do think it's crazy and i and i was embarrassed to talk about it because i suffered as a child, I grew up a Jehovah Witness, and I was always like super embarrassed to be a Jehovah Witness, and I was afraid mm -hmm. of the kids finding out. So I didn't want to be a, a weirdo again. <laughs> no, I totally get that. You know what I mean? Like I didn't want to be the guy that was having weird stuff happen to me. I didn't want to sound pretentious. Oh, I'm psychic. Oh, I have these gifts. You know, I just I just wanted to figure out what the fuck was really going on because I started it started dawning on me that the world we live in has something else happening to it that is on our periphery that uh, needs to be figured out if you're going to have any successful say at your own life you know what i mean i think yeah so i don't know otherwise we're the chicken it's the chickens again with it laying the eggs and not figuring out where their eggs are going and just going on with their own chicken lives not thinking about what if what's on the other side of that fence you know what i mean yeah so after you checked yourself into the ER and, you know, you said you went and got a guru and, and, you know, started to explore this or whatnot. Yeah. What was the process like of, of starting to explain what you had gone to gone through to other people? Like how long did that take? I still not, I'm still not good at it, man. That's the funny thing. In fact, it took till maybe it took like 10 years mm -hmm. for me to, first of all, I was terrified that I was going crazy. I mean, sure. I really was. I, I doubted every second of it. Um, uh, the other thing was that it involved processing trauma. It involved processing karma. And that meant me having to go through really bad purges that people, that, people who take ayahuasca talk about mm -hmm. these purges they go through. Um, it's the same thing with, with somebody who's going through a, like what they would call a spiritual emergency. In this case, Kundalini qualifies for that. And in mm -hmm. fact, a lot of people are going through this. It's not just me. I know a lot of people that aren't maybe having such a severe degree of it, but they're experiencing changes in the way they feel and they think, and they, 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 they might be depressed for a brief period and they might cry and then they might speak light language. I don't know. Like it, right. there's a, a, yeah, there's a lot of people that are really are going through what I, what I went through. I just went through it before. I think a lot of people uh, were kind of aware that there was a big change afoot and mm -hmm. I always thought I was crazy. And to this, I know I, I no longer believe that I am crazy at all. I, I definitely am okay. 100% convinced of my own sanity. It's just that it's such an extraordinary thing to, to have to process, but I don't really feel that I'm that alone in it anymore. I feel mm -hmm. a lot of other people are starting to kind of get the idea. You get, when you get trapped though, I'll bring, I'll bring this up. Mm -hmm. the, the part that terrified me the most was about two years ago, maybe three when the spiritual UFO paranormal people that I was talking to started, I don't want to get into politics, but started getting nope, into the please. Trump thing. So getting into the Trump thing. And I'm like, wait guys, like how's, how are all you who are so in this enlightened path, quote unquote, falling for that. And that's a whole other subject about how you can be as enlightened as you think you are. But if, if you have emotional bias, if you have certain unconscious prejudices or whatever, anybody can kind of come along on the outside sometimes and manipulate you. Right. It's not your I mean, I don't want to blame that person personally. It's just part of the the way life goes. You have to be able to see that when it's time. But anyway, so my my theory on that, <clears throat> oh, yeah, is that quote unquote conspiracy theories are a drug, right? So it, it's yeah. really easy yeah. once you start going down a rabbit hole, right, 
right. another door opens, another door, whatever, and and That's next true. thing you know, yeah, you know, it, it's like it's like Alex Jones, right? I mean, yeah. he's obviously extraordinarily controversial, yeah, um, and he's he's, I mean, in many ways, he is fucking batshit crazy, yeah, but um, he also has these things that that are are very truthful, you know, that he says, yeah, and. You know, it's I, I can't have a conversation about Alex Jones with anyone because I know. they're like, well, how can you listen? Like he denied Sandy Hook, right, or or whatever. You yeah, know? and yeah, he yeah. did. He's fucking crazy. But he also has these these things that he says that other people are just afraid to say. Yeah, and um, you know, so I'll watch an entire you know whatever like joe rogan has had him on multiple times and i've watched all of those and you know he he's obviously not entirely there right i mean there, there's something happening in his brain right um but when he does have a point and he can stick to the point which is something he has a, a hard time doing but yeah if he can stick to a point yeah um yeah i mean there's definitely some truth there you know, the enemy there's a there's a well there's a saying uh look look i mean this is how life goes man if, if people are smart they they do this um the enemy of your enemy is your friend and, and, and alex jones isn't my friend but he's the enemy of the establishment now right. what you have to do if you're smart as a human being if you're any kind of if you got any kind of strategy in your head is you're going to look and see what everyone's play is people say all kinds of shit but what is their right. play what is their ultimate end goal of both themselves and the people funding them um you look at alex jones i think he likes to make a lot of money off supplements but what he likes to do to make that money is interesting because he finds the the missing piece of the puzzle in the mainstream and you don't have to believe the rest of what he says but the fact if he didn't exist who would be out there like the, the one thing that alex jones did that um again personnel i'm not i'm not here to to love alex jones i'm not here to sure. you know but he's a person in history who's done something very unique and he went to bohemian grove and he got that footage that's right and up yeah. until was was rachel maddow going to do that was was anderson cooper going to do that right. no right and they're not bad people because they didn't do it they're not part i'm not saying they're part of the illuminati they might be but there's i'm not saying they are it's just that <laughs> It's just that you have to look at that situation and go, what's missing from the picture? And when someone goes out there and does something crazy like that, all right, you can hate them all you want. But what is it that they found that still remains true? And true. that is you got a bunch of rich people getting up every year and going to child mock sacrifice parties dressed as, uh, you know, KKK with, in red. And I don't know. I don't have to tell you, like, that's not normal. I don't get invited to those parties. And, yeah. you know, I, my, my, my buddies, we get some, some hot dogs and some coarse light, you know, we don't have to do a <laughs> uh, a mile, uh, uh, a mock child sacrifice that to, to, to bond. So it's like, like, that's the thing that's always missing from discussions about conspiracy theorists and stuff. It's mm -hmm. like, yeah, I get it. He's, he's not, I don't believe in that everything David Icke says or, or, or Jones say, but they're pointers to stuff that you should be kind of going, well, wait a second. What do you, why do you bring that up? Is that true? Right. Like investigate it yourself and ask yourself because the dynamic of his existence and Ike's runs, it runs such a wide spectrum. They can be good people one day, bad people the next, just like every other fucking person, you know, well, it's, there, there's what drove him to, what drove him to find that information. And is that information still relevant outside of the social ramifications you know right. what I mean? Because you're going to, because it's like, it's, you're leaving information on the table that all throughout history, there are instances of people trying to do one thing and they accidentally do something else. That's ex more extraordinary uh, mm -hmm. this, despite their best or worst intentions. If you're a smart player, you're going to look at the whole thing and go, ah, oh, oh, I see. Oh, that revealed this right. that I didn't expect or that, that, that plague, that, that enemy of this enemy here made a move and discovered something it's all about having a mind that doesn't get trapped by other people's expectations of you so that you can maneuver freely. And, and then, but you gotta be careful of your own bullshit. Like you said, like people right. fall victim to like, it's like a drug, you know, you can keep going down in the rabbit hole to the point where it's like, okay, now I have my own excuse for why I don't want to do anything because everything's a conspiracy. And it's like, mm -hmm. you know, so. Well, there's, there's a weird, um, I'm gonna coin a phrase here, social blanket. Right, that that comes over people like like yeah, you know, yeah. Ike and yeah. and and Jones and yeah. I mean, 
Bob Lazar even, for example, right? I mean, so basically the blanket says you can't listen to these people because they're either controversial or they're crazy or or whatever. You're right? going to pay a price for it socially if you're not, if you're not careful. If you say oh, absolutely. It. Yeah, that's absolutely. the problem. That's a real thing. You know, it's um, not yeah, I mean, even talking to my my girlfriend about Alex Jones one time, um, and I was like, yeah, I just watched this interview and like, you know, it was kind of interesting. You know, like I don't agree with probably probably ninety five percent of the shit that comes out of its mouth. Yeah, yeah. But there's like that five percent that is okay. You know, yeah. I don't I don't firmly believe it, but it's interesting. You know, something for me to look into a little bit more. Whenever you, but my thing is, I always want to find out what everyone's true motivation is in life. Mm -hmm. uh, what I will say with Alex Jones is I think he's very curious about the real reality of what we're living in. I mm -hmm. think that's, that's the, that's the benevolent aspect to his character. Mm -hmm. I'd say at this point with, with his success being what he is, he probably also feeds off in a negative way, the ego that comes from being the person who gives, it's like, it's like Stephen right. Allen. It's like Greer. Greer has the same issue. I don't know if you know, Stephen I Greer. love Stephen Greer. I'm trying to get yeah. him on by the way. Oh, okay. I would love to talk to him for like an hour. That would be so much fun. Greer. Greer's got a reputation though. He's got a reputation of being kind of like, like he's on one hand, he is, I actually almost shot his last film. I actually got to wow. talk. Yeah. I was going to shoot the last documentary. They, I got in contact with the producer for that and I was supposed to, uh, to film it, but he wanted me to defer the, the, the upfront fees. I was like, I can't, I mm -hmm. can't afford to shoot eight right. months yeah. and I get paid. No. So Greer, here's, here, Greer's another perfect example of the de debacle we're talking about, which I'm glad we're talking about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's a great conversation. It's it's a difficult one, and but it's it's the key to how we stay, why most humans stay trapped in this box. Greer single-handedly for me introduced me to all the main concepts and issues around the UFO politics that exist. Right. And he wasn't he wasn't wrong about any of it. I mean, he's absolutely been great about you know getting people to kind of see what the issues are, what the what the reality is of UFOs, that they should be taken seriously, that they connect to us in a way that in our politics that's runs really deep so that that part of, i look at i look at greer as the as the uh the guy the, the ambassador right the downside to greer in my opinion i don't want to get out there too much on yeah, this, this is that i think he now considers himself the gatekeeper so unless you you know you want only the truth and you you're only going to go through him like i feel like he's right. kind of he's kind of put himself out there as like no i'm the guy you should be talking to which is a little bit you know, to me, a little bit of an ego thing, but that doesn't detract from what he said. You know what I'm saying? Like that doesn't stop what he said about anything from being true. Humans don't want to admit how much social bias and, and almost bullying like keeps them from just seeing the situation for what it is and then going about their own way to fall out. I mean, Alex Jones, like I said, with Bohemian Grove, like that, you know, you can hate him all you want, but no, who else was going to do that? No, nobody else did. So hate him if you want, but just be glad he caught the footage. Be glad he's made that a legitimate conversation so people can start having it, right? I don't have to love the guy. I can still hate him for whatever. One more right. thing, a big part of what you're talking about the other day, someone criticized the Rothschild family. I can't remember who it was. And the whole mainstream press called that an anti-Semitic remark. And I'm like, oh I, I, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No. If you we, want to shut down any criticism of one, it, it, yeah, yeah, call man semantic. If you say anything about the Rothschilds, you're anti semitic You know. Yeah, we, we wow. we've gone batshit crazy. crazy in in regards to to political correctness or I mean, whatever the fuck they call it now. Yeah, and I get it. You know, like maybe there there's people that are anti semitic who are going to use that, but they're also a family who's got a notoriously horrific banking history. Right. <laughs> it has yeah, nothing absolutely. to do with them being Jewish. They're just bad bankers. They're just bad at right. banking. They're bad at manipulating government. <laughs> I don't care about the Jewish part. I care about that. You know, that's what Actually, we're talking I, about. I would argue I about the Jewish, Jewish part. Very good at their banking and, and, uh, Oh, you're true. You're right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's it, that. It's a bad consequence, but you know, what they do is they do it really well. You know, it's sort of like Donald Trump. Donald Trump is, a, you know, a fucking carnival barker, but what he does, he yeah, does really fucking yeah. well. I mean, like really well. Every, everything about our matrix, yeah. I mean, and your and your point is really great. I mean, everything about our matrix, everything about the world we live in. I just hope people can someday get to a place that they can trust their ability to use their own reason, despite however crazy things might sound or people. But, but you have to respect how much of an effect uh, people's 
thoughts on you nowadays affect the way you, you speak because I, have to, I mean, I'm even nervous about saying certain things. And that's, that's part of the strategy though. When you recognize it for what it is, that's part of the, the way in which people are now being manipulated is shut up, you know, don't, don't talk about you risk this. That's a, that's a big no, no, in my opinion. You know, I, I, I get the danger of it. I get the danger of Trump having a Twitter account. I do, but you have to be, if you're on the other side and you're, and you're saying this is politically incorrect, you have to also understand that you, just because you have an activist cause that you're proud of, that you support, that's very noble and very generative and, and that it doesn't mean you're immune from being a sociopath too. And there's nothing that prevents you because sociopathy is not specific to anybody's political ideology. It's something no, that it's every not. human being <clears throat> suffers from. Sooner or later, it's not. You know? so, and so, yeah. you know, for me, I, I like to watch that stuff. So, you know, it, it, it kind of gets back to the, you know, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? I so agree with that listening to, like, I religiously watched everything that came out of Donald Trump's mouth, right? <laughs> I watched everything and yeah, yeah. it was painful, but I did it because I want to know exactly what this, this guy is saying, right? Totally. And yeah. for me, not wanting to do that just shows well laziness and stupidity as far as i'm concerned right like you want to know what yeah. what you know your enemy is saying um you know what it is it's, it makes you vulnerable not knowing that's why i look yeah. at it like you're, you're vulnerable i watch fox news not because i like china but because i want to know what this idiot is telling mm -hmm. everybody and why they believe it i want to know their talking point like you, you know what i mean i want to know I'm not afraid to, to, to listen to Sean Hannity. I'm not, if someone's going to someone's going to accuse me of liking Fox News, well, fine. I don't. That, they're they're dumb. They're going to miss the boat somewhere down the line when a Capitol riot happens. Like I knew something like that was going to happen. I was reading a post on that. I knew. I've been telling people about civil war for like a couple years now. I was like, oh, this yeah. is we're going to get to that point where we're going to have violence, guys. Like it's going to happen. Like no amount of insulating yourself with tweets and words you're not supposed to say and safe spaces is going to keep you are safe like you, you have to know what is coming so that you have right. a way to and it doesn't mean you're aligned with it it's just it's just it's a you know it's to some degree life is a battlefield i mean it really is we're we're in a war of that's why i named the band that i'm in flash flesh war because i feel like every day you're fighting a flesh war you're yeah you're you're basically some somebody wants a piece of you on some level they want your soul they want your body fluids they want your psychology. So you better have a plan to, to try to anticipate what it is that they that they want from you, what their play is. I don't care if they're Democrat or Republican or Christian or anything else. Like everybody has a play. And some of it's probably benign. Let's say 50% is always benevolent, or maybe most of it, but it's that asshole who who knows that he can manipulate that infrastructure or she or him you know, to their own will. And they don't care what the noble, the, the, the larger noble purpose is of the organization. Like conservatism right. has noble aspects to it. Liberalism has um, noble components to it, but that's separate from the psychology of a sociopath who looks at both and goes, eh, I can put a little money over here and get this person to yell at that person there, get this over here. And everyone's going to, and no one can touch me because if I, if they do, I'll say that that I'm this and I'm protected. Oh, like that's not, has nothing to do with the ideology. That's just the way mm -hmm. humans, everybody's an asshole waiting to happen in my book. That's how I look at life. Everybody's yeah. an asshole waiting to happen. You know, okay. We all have our bad days. So what? Just, just deal with it. Like don't, you don't need a, a movement to get around that. Like just, just be like, Hey, you know, humans have a tendency to look out for their own interests sooner or later. So know what that interest is ahead of time. And then you can like avoid that. Con uh, like when Alex Jones talks about supplements, I have to go, well, there's a 50% chance the supplement is not going to work. He just wants to sell me money. Or maybe it does kind of work, but maybe not as well as he says it does. Or maybe it completely works. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe he, I should just he go was figure out what ashwagandha does on its own. Right? Wasn't that his big thing? Colloidal salt? Yeah, I know. Awesome. Yeah. But that's actually probably good for you. Well, it might be, but... You know, no, I, it's it's a big thing. I, I get people offering me it all the time. There's a uh, maybe uh, good. I don't know. What was the thing that that was turning people blue? Zinc. That's right. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, this is a few years back. Do you remember that whole thing? And there was that, really? that one guy. Um, oh, that's and he was a politician. I think it was from it was Kentucky or somewhere like that. Yeah, and he had turned like bright, bright purple, and like it's it's completely unreversible. <laughs> yeah. So the guy has like this bright purple, what? like mess. It's unreversible. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So it's like it's like once it gets into your your body, oh, it doesn't go away. You oh. know. So he was taking like a I forget what it was, but it was like a hundred times the, the recommended amount of zinc. Yeah. Every yeah. day. And like you know, two years later, he literally just turned purple. <laughs> He looks like he looks like a, a Smurf yeah. or something, right? He's probably got really high testosterone though, because zinc is good for your testosterone. <laughs> it could be, but I mean, <laughs> who would want to fuck you if you were bright purple? You know, I, I'm sure there's some fetishists out there who would find that attractive. But uh, that's where the furry conventions come in handy, because I'm yeah. pretty sure like you, you and Barney would but be, make a good couple. Yeah, though. yeah. it's know. like you're not going on Tinder to hook up. You know, when you're no. when you're bright purple. Not unless you got like a good filter you put on that, but well, you yeah, know, I mean, eventually going to see you in person, so you know, yeah, you have to yeah. you have to deal with that. Yeah, um, that's not good. Purple is not is not a good thing. It's not. It's not. Um, you know, I'm 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 more worried about turning yellow, you know, because of you know alcohol or whatever. You know, like at, at well, some point, yeah. at some point, our vices come back and bite us in the ass, and and uh, <laughs> I think. I think I'd rather eventually turn yellow, knock on wood, hopefully it never happens, but then turn bright purple. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's reversible. You just got to like get, get some yeah. supplements. Let's milk thistle for your liver. Yeah. Uh, milk thistle. Purple for life is not good. I can't do it. Um, it oh, you my, tried it? Yeah. It makes me, it makes my stomach super upset. Like I can't, you know, it, it's been, oh, it's been oh, about a decade though. So maybe I should try again. Um, I mean, you know, it's better than turning purple. No, so so let me bring us. To you. Uh, so, have you gotten people that have you find it really hard to tell them if you are listening to alternative sources or whatever? You you got to be very okay. conscious about what you say to them. Like, do you find oh, that as a big problem? Yeah, yeah I'm the same way. Yeah. Um, I have to know my audience. Yeah, it, but part of that is me not wanting to talk about it. Right, because there is yeah. there's a stigma involved. Um, it's sort of like looking at um, uh, zero hedge, right? So yeah, yeah. As far as so, when I first started looking at zero hedge, it was more of of just weird alternative market strategies and whatnot, you know, for for investing in stocks like that. That's yeah. basically what it was all about. Yeah, um, yeah, and I read it pretty religiously, you know. Right. Um, and then at some point it became this fucking psycho sort of, sort of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I still read it from time to time. Um, but, but I'm very hesitant to talk about it, you know, in, in public just because, it's been, you know, yeah. it, it's sort of like looking at or listening to, you know, coast to coast. Cause even, you know, like our bell has been, you know, demonized in recent years. Um, oh, even though really? he was very upfront of, about being like, I'm a fucking entertainer, you know, like, I, I think these things are interesting and, and whether I believe in them or not, it's sort of like secondary. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But if you say like, oh yeah, no, I, you know, I, I religiously listen to coast to coast. People are like, you're, you're a fucking psycho. Right. Like <laughs> yeah. there's something not right with you. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's yeah, a problem again, with everybody now. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say that that kind of gets back to the whole social blanket that we all kind of have draped over us now. Right, right. You know, it's like if if it's unacceptable to enough people, then it's just simply not acceptable. Right? Yeah, yeah. Because I think it's I think before you could say certain things and it could it would be understood in the context of the of the who you were talking to, but now there's literally armies of people on the internet waiting for you to say the one thing. That they can spin it out any way they want, right. completely out of context, and destroy you. Actually, actually, physically destroy your life. So the, yeah. so it's not just like a. Like it used to be like a reprimand, but now it's like you're. There was a guy. I'm gonna say it. I don't give a shit. There was a guy in China who was teaching English. He was a British guy, and he used in in Chinese, literally in the language of Chinese. Uh, I think it's uh, Cantonese, the dialect. There's a word called niga. 
he got. Oh, right. No, no, no. I, I know this story. Yeah. He That's got insane. fired for speaking. Yeah. And it's like, you're kidding me. Like, there's no excuse for that. Like, that is just the language. And yeah, it could mean that if you were saying it that way, right. but you're not. You're speaking Chinese. So it's well, not the same damn thing. And you can't make everything that way. You know, right. you can't. And, Otherwise, we're going to live in a crazy world. Yeah, so the one that that That's always nice. gets me, and this happened, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, maybe ten years ago, is that the poor politician who used the word niggardly and was completely censured for oh. using the word niggardly. Like, oh. you know, and I tried to explain to people Does, like, that well, probably means something. Yeah. Well, it, miserly basically is what it means, but um. Oh, okay. And. It's not even the same root, right? So the word doesn't have the same word or the same root as is you know the, oh, the other word. Oh, I see. So I'm like, oh, I see. Yeah, and then this person was fired, you know, for for using this and and basically yeah. censured. I forget, they were a yeah. public official or something like that. Um. Yeah. And that's when I was like, okay, our world has gone batshit crazy. Like everything is just like, you know, you you can't you can't talk anymore. Like, I mean, and I, I don't want to get into yeah. that weird fucking thing where like, Oh, you can't talk anymore. Like, you know, people are censoring everything. Cause I, that's yeah. part of it. Like, I, I, I personally don't believe there, there's like some, some giant entity that is keeping us from saying things. I think we as a population, um, have gotten to the point where, well, we're fucked. I mean, really, that, that's what it comes down to. Right. I, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I don't. I don't think there's something nefarious behind it necessarily. I think it's just we as a we as humanity has kind of reached that point where we're we're doing these things to ourselves. We're censoring ourselves. We're, you know. Yeah, I think we fell victim to the algorithm. I think I think people have forgotten that. Like 20 years ago, like me and you were in our in, our, in the 90s. You know, mm -hmm. there was a different dynamic socially with people. You you would borrow sugar from your neighbor when you needed to borrow it. You would have basic conversations with people, and you. Yeah, they might have been dicks for some reason or whatever, but you still had to form a uh, some kind of social fabric in order to sustain each other. Mm -hmm. um, what's happened, I think, is computers have trained us to think in a very binary either or way. Hey, <laughs> Jesus Christ, man! Zoom is <laughs> Zoom is like hanging, and it's just being it's being oh, really gosh. really fucked up. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, boy, you're gonna test my editing skills on this one. Sorry, I know we've been. We, I, I just realized we've been going at it for almost two hours. Sorry. I know, I know. We we need to start wrapping this up. Sure. Um, I mean, we could probably talk for another two or three, but you know, well, well, let's let's do a round two yeah. <laughs> later on. Yeah. Um, I I think we were talking about political correctness like right before everything let out, but yeah. Um something along those lines yeah um and i think i think generally what we what we came up with is that um we're in a society where where um and i'm hesitant to use the term but alternative ways of looking at things are are frowned upon right very much so yeah and it, it it's hard to even talk about it because if you do people are like well we've associated that with being like supporters of Donald Trump or whatever. It's so you know? weird because 20 years ago, if you talked about conspiracies, you were considered a Democrat liberal. You must be a liberal. <laughs> right. That's the, that's the craziest thing. And it, it's so weird how it got flipped. Like yeah. you're talking about conspiracies. You're must, you must be a conservative or something or a Trump supporter. It's like, Oh, like the algorithms have, have cajoled, people into thinking in ways that they don't even see are limiting and uh if, there, if there's any like i appreciate everything about political correctness that is, is supposed to serve a higher good but people mm -hmm. don't people don't res people don't respect the, the how much their shadow their uh, the in, in union psychology the shadow uh manifest in, in individuals mm -hmm. and it projects that it, just not having that basic common understanding of uh how psychology works people in the long run think they're creating this infrastructure to, you know, in, in, enable humanity to be better, be, be less, uh, you know, persecuted, less prejudice. 
but while that's happening, the architecture for oppression is also being implemented, but you're not even your, your mind, because your mind is no longer able to think non-linearly. Your mind has been programmed to think this good, this bad, say this, this wrong. Okay, right. as long as that holds true for however long, great. The minute that some sociopath comes in later and goes, oh, isn't this nice? I've got all this infrastructure that's been set up by these well-intentioned college kids to dominate social agendas. Ooh, what if I have a social agenda that benefits me, but I can hide it? behind all of this great infrastructure. These kids are too dumb to see that that's possible. I'm not saying they're dumb, but they're, they don't even right. realize it's possible. It's possible to be an asshole and have good intentions. It's possible. Of course. <laughs> yeah. of course. Look yeah, at the 20th we, century. We, we, we live in this world where um, everyone sees in black and white. Yeah. The majority of people look in black and white. And Really the worst thing that's ever happened, I think, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and the reality is gray is actually where most people are i'm sorry where most things live yeah yeah you know you know the only thing i can tell the only thing i can really say to anybody this is my philosophy now is that um you know we're at a time in human history where the data is overwhelming and the wisdom is lacking you know you have all this information you have all this knowledge but how to apply it in a way that's meaningful and ultimately going to lead to the highest good from a human point of view right now, I don't think the answer exists. I don't think it exists within politics or even religion. I think it's all about the aliens. And I'll tell you why. Oh, perfect. I love it. Because <laughs> we're all aliens. We don't even know it. We're all, we're all removed from ourselves by a few degrees. Uh, our higher selves, mm -hmm. I think, were estranged from us somehow with all the stuff that's gone on in our world. And we're living mm -hmm. off, we're, we're operating in like a very small subset of reality that allowed to be manipulated by these frozen again oh fuck <clears throat> Totally, totally frozen, dude. Um, if you come back, I think we should do a wrap up and then do a round two. I don't know if you can hear me or not. God damn it. Nope, you're gone. Hey Richard. Hey. Yeah, Zoom is Zoom is like shitting the bed all over the place. No, it's okay. Um, and it happened yesterday too. But hold on, when did I start talking? Yeah, okay, one fifty. Um, I'm trying to keep notes here so I I know what to, uh, what to edit. And again, I'm so not good at this. So we we have a lot more to talk about. So I'm going to invite you back for for a okay. round two. Yeah. Um, and... Should I try to wrap up? So we don't get caught up again or yeah, why don't we do that? Um I have a hard stop. Well, I, I had a hard stop, but that's okay. Yeah, I um I probably should have left. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> anyway. It's been fun though, um, man. I mean, I, I find it fascinating that somebody like you've, you've held on to that ability to like take alternate information and despite, you know, the risk involved with that. I think that's a, that's commendable because it's uh, it's a becoming rare and rare thing. And I don't, I don't think it's just because we're crazy or anything. I think it's just intuitively some people that tend to have a little bit of intelligence understand they got to like keep a, their eye out, you know, for right. developments that they might not know about. Other well, people. I think even the, the phrase alternative, which is why I hesitated to say it earlier, yeah. Yeah. it makes you sound like you're crazy no matter what, right? It's yeah. alternative. It's not, it's not real. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Would, would, to be honest, and we don't have to dive into this at all, but is the reason why the, the, the term alternative as it related to music always pissed me off. Mm. Like an alternative to what? Like that means yeah. it's not real music. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. It's an alternative. Yeah. Like it deviates too much from the industry standard. Well, what's the standard? Is it the standard any good? Is the standard the totality of everything? Right. You know? I mean, that's the thing, you know, what are we missing from, from modern music well alternative i guess is what we're missing but it's music too you know it's not i mean that's and again that's like the whole thing with me and my philosophy on life is that you know what are we not getting from the you know we had we had a channel we had when i grew up on tv you had four channels you had five channels but obviously right. obviously there were many more waiting to happen you know we just didn't get right. to it until till now so I don't know. I think I think humans have a tendency to always stick their head in the sand because the world's a scary place. I get it, it. It's terrifying. It's yeah, terrifying. it's absolutely terrifying. You know. And, so, and <clears throat> getting back to to the alternative music thing is that alternative. What was called alternative music is now music. Yeah. And I don't even know what's now called alternative. Like you know, I mean, who knows? There's probably some yeah that mumble rap or something it's mumble like that. rap. I was going to say mum, I say mumble core mumble rap was was the alternative. It's like the so the worst cool. music you can possibly make in order to piss because you can't piss off your elders anymore because we're we're crazy. We were the right. ones doing all the radical shit. Yeah. So you, how are you going to offend us? Well, the only way you can really offend us if you just don't make real music. Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> well, think about it. You know, like I, right, I, I yeah, I probably do more drugs than than the majority of kids who are listening to mumble rap. You know, like so. No kidding. It's right. really hard to you know be yeah. weird around me i'm like oh okay well you can't out weird that's the not weirdo. a big deal yeah you can't out weird the weirdo but we were no uh, that's interesting right maybe the peak of civil i tell people as a joke but i'm kind of half serious that we might have hit the peak of civilization around 1996 <laughs> it's possible because <laughs> i don't i think ever since then it's been like okay too many too much technology too much access right. to every everybody and everything and i don't know like it's a weird a weird theory i have well i think i think definitely creativity kind of went off a cliff right about that yeah time. yeah okay. yeah i mean it, it things just have gotten very like un, without people knowing that there people talk about unconscious bias a lot but like people don't realize that twitter and the infrastructure you're looking at technology through has a bias built into it that um you know, you gotta be, you gotta be aware of, you know, like Facebook has, I think an agenda to, without even realizing it kind of ferment hate, not because it's a uh, hateful in and of itself, but because people go on Facebook, they, they, they vent and that pisses off somebody else. Next thing you know, it's everyone's venting and getting mad at each other. And before you know it, you've, you've pissed your, you've, you've wasted your whole day responding right. to comments, you know? So, so whether Facebook meant to do that or not, I don't know, but that's what's happened, right? Right. So my thought on that is that hate is a very easy emotion, right? Mm. It's just, it's something you can like reach in and just, it's, it's right there. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, and so expressing that is, is um, relatively easy. No, good point. Um, expressing things like, like um, some of the things you've talked about on social media, mm. um, that's a lot harder to do because you're, you're, you're kind of reaching in for an authenticity that um, is, is hard to communicate now. Yeah, it right? is definitely. Yeah. Hate and rage and, you know, all of those emotions are, are they're easy because they're everywhere. You get points for it. You get, you get shares, you get people yeah. share in their, I guess growing up like in a quasi cult, um, being the weirdo it just taught me that you can't lie to yourself you can right. lie to everybody else but you can't lie to yourself and i think 
people that are just going for the easy hate or the easy whatever uh, reprimands, they're lying to themselves. They're right. not being really honest about the whole thing. I mean, I, and then also there's this, I hate to say it, but a lot of Vietnam vets and war vets have this where they have, they've had to, they've had to live in very uh, morally ambiguous experiences. You know, they've mm -hmm. had experiences where like, if they didn't do this one thing here, that was really terrible. Then this other thing was going to happen regardless. It's kind of mm -hmm. what Starleaf's about. If he doesn't shoot the guy and risk killing the kid, he's putting a bunch of other innocent people at risk. So there's no, so when you're in the no win situation, uh, another type of living has to kind of come out from your, from your being. That's a lot mm -hmm. more, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's quote unquote trans rational. And oh, I um, like that. Yeah. Like you, it's a bit of intuition. It's a bit of inevitability. It's a bit of surrender and it's a bit of making the best decision you can make at the time. And then seeing where the bee bumbles after that, but too many people um, are just unwilling to, to, to be honest in a, in an uncomfortable way. Um, they call that uh, what's that when you're caught between two cognitive dissidents, like you, mm -hmm. you they get caught so then they default to what's acceptable. And that might get you by temporarily if you're in a life-threatening situation. If, uh, if, a, if somebody has a gun to your head and says, you know, I want you to believe in this God or I'll kill you. Like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a 100% believer. You know, I'll tell them whatever they want to hear to get out of that situation. Right. <laughs> but you can't actually believe you're a believer, you know. And so that's, uh, I don't know. I just think right now people need to embrace the the chaos a little bit kind of realize it's an opportunity to bring to the table something that may be dormant in right. their own potential i don't know one of one of the the biggest argument arguments for simulation theory mm. is exactly that that things oh. have, have reached an untenable point where yeah. it just it doesn't make sense anymore yeah yeah i agree with that you know yeah i totally agree so what what exactly who do you think is running the simulation then in your opinion that's something I haven't really thought about because it's a terrifying thing to think about. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm not a hundred percent into simulation theory. I just yeah, think it's, right. it's, it's it out there. It's extraordinarily plausible, you know, based yeah. on, on where we are. Yeah. And I, I, I had played around with the theory before, mm -hmm. but to be honest, when Donald Trump was elected, that was, I was like, okay, we, we are living in, in an, I don't know, an alternative universe of, of some kind. Like this, this is not, yeah. there's no way this can actually happen. Have you ever taken like uh, any of the psychedelics before in oh, your life? No, I used yeah, to, yeah. I used to eat acid by the sheet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why you're so, that's why you're so <laughs> well adjusted. Uh, Maybe. No, I think it's really true. I, I think, I think, I think there's a non-personal, uh, a non-intelligent, space in that the human soul the human being accesses mm -hmm. outside of immediate awareness i think that is the core fundamental of reality and i think the way it plays out it plays out separate from our human agenda per se or mm -hmm. our human and our human agenda let's just say if we're going to use maybe carl jung terminology is the is the individual personality and what we think is ourselves because most people think they're mm -hmm. just their personality but they're not they're really that's just a small component of a larger psyche that is dormant in most people and, and is unconscious. I think, I think something is going on right now where, um, I don't know that that component of who we are is trying to emerge and restore order or restore a new world for us when it's more in, in line with our true selves, our true mm -hmm. state. And I think the drugs, when I've taken certain drugs or I've had certain other spiritual experiences, I've had that moment where like, Oh, the base reality is actually maybe good. The problem is free will and other things when they start rendering out into the, to either the simulation or into what we call physical reality, mm -hmm. things go wrong and things can turn sideways. And in order to get back to something that's a little bit more um, maybe healthy for an individual or for a society, these mm -hmm. purges, these, these things are going to happen. Um, and it's just, uh, we don't have the infrastructure for it as a society. We don't have mm -hmm. religions that make sense anymore. We don't have politics that make sense anymore. So hopefully people will either eat a lot of acid or they'll take a lot of <laughs> mushrooms or they'll, they'll have some spiritual experiences through meditation. They'll do something that unplugs them from, if there's one Alex Jones conspiracy that I actually think is hundred percent true and it's the, okay. 
It's the AI, the idea that there are negative forces, uh, human and non-human, that will hopefully, I don't think AI is bad in and of itself, mm -hmm. but two things. One, you don't have currently a holistic understanding of what life really is. So that puts you at a slight disadvantage when you're trying to weigh out the pros and cons of AI. Second, mm -hmm. AI, if AI becomes an interface between the body and the mind, and we don't know what the, what's going on in the unconscious mind, yet now there's a mechanism to interact with the body in a way that uh, violates our sovereignty without us knowing, then that's a problem. You know, I think that's that's a legitimate, I know it sounds like I'm going off the deep end, but no, I, don't I feel like don't. if you go on, if you, I feel like if we go into the AI world and we're not cognizant of what we are as humans beyond the body, mm -hmm we might be at a disadvantage that's right. not that's my thought there's there's a great youtube channel um called pursuit of wonder and if you haven't oh. checked it out you definitely should well yeah. um it's a singular guy who creates these these incredible videos and, and they're mostly about um the inner workings of the mind and whatnot so hmm. one of them is called and i'm going to butcher it but it's called something like yourself that thing you can't really touch but that's always there no. right so the concept of yourself yeah it, it's a weird like i'm sure you have um sat and thought about like okay well what am i right yeah. it's like totally, it's, yeah. it's a fundamental human question totally yeah but i think a lot of people don't actually ask themselves that question like what does that mean like who yeah. am i yeah um, and it, it's it's a it's a rabbit hole you could definitely spend a lot of time well, down. there was, there was a, uh, so and the reason why people can't answer that question is because they have too much external stimuli now that's triggering them every, every minute to, there was a, one of the biggest, most profound experiences I had as I spent 10 days at a Buddhist monastery where you couldn't speak. Oh, wow. so you had to be, yeah. You had to be completely silent and you had to meditate for 10 hours a day. It's in on Alaska, Washington. Um, mm -hmm. It's called Vipassana. It's a Vipassana meditation. And so, you know, when you don't, when you're not interacting with anyone and you're not taking in external stimuli, your awareness in certain individuals will, will shift. It'll start going, well, I can't, I can't absorb any information from out here. So now that it becomes like a mirror almost to your own thoughts. And I had some profound moments where I was like, wow, so this is why people don't speak at these damn things, because you do start to encounter, and especially if you have calorie deficits, you start kind of going into a fasting state, it does create a physiological opportunity to interface with your innermost self a little bit easier. So I think that's why people don't have those conversations because if you're constantly getting dopamine hits all day, like what do you, what do you got to think about? You know, you've got your thinking handed to you. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, I think um and i'm hesitant to say this because it's something you know fucking joe rogan talks about all the time but um you know you, you've earlier talked about you know ayahuasca and yeah. of course you know dmt is you know the, yeah. the major component of that yeah um i've only done dmt a, a handful of times mm. um and the last time i did it was by accident so <laughs> um Jesus. it was it was liquid DMT that somebody had had put in a joint. And they had told me, like I was sitting in a bar and they gave it to me and they're like, oh yeah, here's a joint, like, you know, and there's something special in there. That's all they said. Or at least that's all I remember them saying. My God. And I smoked some, like I, I walked outside of the bar, I was on my way home. And the bar was like three blocks away from my house. Mm. Um, four hours later, I ended up at my apartment. <laughs> so it was, it was literally like three or four hours of me just like, who the fuck knows what I was doing? Fire <laughs> Square, like, you know, 10 o'clock at night. I I'm surprised you survived, man. Oh, I it's very no good And when I woke up the next morning, um, I felt fine, you know, because TMT actually, you know, like there was, you know, little, little to no hangover. Mm -hmm. um, I had a, drink hangover but you know I, I felt pretty good and i immediately started calling people you know that i knew i had seen that night mm. and i was like hey was i acting weird like you know because i had that that 
that nagging realization in the back of my head that I had gone fucking bonkers for like four hours wandering around Pioneer Square. Yeah. And every single person was like, you know, you were totally fine. You were articulate. Like, you know, you were just, you were having this, this, these conversations that normally you don't have. So that was weird. But other than that, yeah, you were perfectly fine. Oh my God. And I have no recollection. Like, no. Oh, was this MEO, 5MEO, or was it the, was it the hallucinogenic version? Uh, the, the version that sees the spirits? So I, I don't know. So wow. I, I don't remember. So I don't remember having um, any hallucination, hallucinations. You probably um, had the MEO, which is, which is, I've had that once, and that's supposed to be the most powerful psychedelic there is. Man, it was, it was insane. I mean, wow. I, I wish I remembered it. You know, I mean, I remember bits and pieces. Yeah. Um, for example, I remember like when I left the bar and when I got home. Oh, but the majority in between, I have no recollection whatsoever. Did it kick in before you left the bar? That's a really good question. They might have. I think it sounds like your time and space got all warped because oh, it was it yeah. was a disaster, man. Yeah. Complete disaster. <laughs> and luckily, I didn't do what I normally do: was reach for my phone and start randomly texting people. So. <laughs> I went I went completely off the grid for like four or five hours. Thank I, God. I think um, the funny thing is you were probably walking around Pioneer Square and everyone else and you fit right in. If you were acting crazy, nobody would have cared because they've been like, yeah. well, this is the usual. But I have a feeling like with five MEO, I didn't well, I went a little bit crazy, but I also went very deep. And I I've seen some people take five MEO and they just pass out. They have an experience, but they don't remember it. And that's okay too. I mean, it's probably probably better i mean i i don't think psychedelics offer all the solutions but i think for some people that need to at least see the other side of things i think it's really important that they take take one in their life because it's the for some people it's the only way they're ever going to understand that their mind is such a limited construct if, if that's all right. they see themselves as right like you've seen the other side you've had some experiences of life outside of temporal reality and you know that there's other messages waiting there's other um realities present I, I would say realities that are more actually helpful to humans because i i had i did mushrooms one night and had a very profound experience emotionally and i'm pretty sure that saved me 10 years of therapy oh it was useful valid yeah you know i mean it's valid. you can go to pink floyd laser light shows if you want to that's fine right. but, you know it's like but sometimes they can sometimes they'll get you in a place that um, you need to you need some access to if because you, you can't get to it rationally, and that's mm -hmm. the problem now is everybody sees everything through rational means only, and that's a big problem in the Western mind. I think is that the rational world is not the source of anything. It's just kind of where we've we've conceptualized everything to try to make the see separation, the see contrast, but it's not mm -hmm. the origin of anything. Right. It's not the origin of love. It's not the origin of desire. It's just sort of um, how we make sense of those things when they're in conflict, but not what they are um yeah i mean i i could go off for days on this stuff the one thing i like to bring up though with hardcore skeptics mm -hmm. about how reality might actually work is that uh, it, it, it's really fundamental that we haven't figured this out yet when you play a piano and you play a minor key or a major key science can detect the signal you know going into your eardrum sending off a nerve uh whatever it can detect the notes it can it has a way of measuring the amplitude and all that it has no mechanism ever been no mechanism has ever been discovered that explains why you feel a certain way when a minor chord is played or a major chord that's a mm -hmm. separate reality from the one where we're just hearing sounds and you know eardrums are rallying no and that's that's the most that's the biggest part of our lives like the, the the meaning and the and the subjective feeling that we get from all of our experiences so i just feel humans have been kind of railroaded into thinking that life is one way and whatever this is a simulation or not is either purposely or trying to instigate us to try to get back in touch with like the bigger more fundamental reality right. mushrooms are like a hack dmt is a hack into it mm -hmm. Meditation's a hack, maybe getting lucky. I don't know. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, there are all sorts of vices. I mean, right. my take on that is that everything in, in the universe or, or however many universes there are yeah, right. um, is 
mathematical, right? And and can can literally be described by a mathematical equation. We just haven't figured out the equation yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, think these aliens have done it though. They they're they're, they're fucking aliens. flying rings around us. <laughs> maybe, or you know, maybe aliens are time travelers, right? Yeah, and maybe they are us from you know a thousand years in the future or whatever. I, this is probably too much to get into now. We'll save it for the second one. But I, I literally had a time travel experience that changed the way that I, I saw reality. And ever, and ever since that experience, I've not been able to go back to the, the normal world. And, and, and I will say one thing to anybody listening. I don't pretend to have the answers. I, I just know that there's this wall that's up. That's a bullshit wall, you know, between us and these other subjects that are... Because the phenomenon is real. The phenomenon is 100% real. You can start to deduce certain patterns within it that can lead to making, if you're a smart monkey, like I think we are, mm -hmm. you wanna be able to anticipate changes that are coming to your environment. So if you're a smart monkey, you'll, you'll look at those, those holes in the, those rifts and be like, okay, what's going, these patterns? And be like, what's forming here, you know? But uh, I don't really know that all the details. I just know that enough of it's true to completely circumvent the consensus reality we live in completely. And, and, and that makes me and a lot of people uncomfortable, but we have to deal with it because if you don't get a heads up on that, you could get, you could get your ass handed to you down the road in some way, you know, and that's yeah, what I'm trying absolutely. to avoid. Yeah. W was it you that, that posted the thing about um, the common ancestor between apes and humans? Yeah. It's so again, this is a huge topic, but I, I want to kind of get into it just a tiny bit. Yeah, let me um, let me just yeah go ahead. Sorry, go. Ahead. I get really excited about that topic. No, of course, and 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 I want you to talk about it. Um, I I kind of went through and did a, a tiny bit of research of my own, and it was like, yeah, no, that's actually you know actually true. Like we go from like a a ninety seven percent compatibility with apes, yeah, to suddenly you know like, yeah. so something happened. Yeah, like the major happened, and the odds of it happening are a super low in terms of them happening and being successful, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the chain of events, that's the number one fucking thing that I want to bring up with this is that we all go through life assuming that the answers that are, that the experts have figured everything out and something so fundamental as this has not been figured out or admitted to science lies by omission. Christianity and, and churches might lie through outright manipulation, mm -hmm. but science, science is more subtle about it. Science will basically go, well, we know in general, this is probably true. And if anything conflicts with that data, we're going to, we're going to leave it out. Right. Which is not lying. True. But it's like, well, wait a second, guys. Cause, cause, cause then when you get stuck in as a human is like, I can only choose between these two. And that's not how life works. Life is pretty unexpected. If there's one thing mm -hmm. about life, it's often very unexpected. So real quick, Last common ancestor. That's the term we've been, that's the missing link that we've been all trying to mm -hmm. find. And most, most people don't realize who haven't been following modern evolutionary theories that we have never found the primate that existed that both humans and chimpanzees and other apes came from. That, that human, mm -hmm. that hominid has mm -hmm. never been found. Like, and, and we keep trying to find intermediary hominids out there, but they all tend to be mostly ape or mostly human so mm -hmm. the ancestor first of all first and foremost the ancestor by which we all came from that we share these common traits with apes from we've never found it but we know it exists so there's right. some creature out there of course my theory is whatever we'll get into that in a second the second <laughs> part that's interesting is that to make a human being it requires this hominids dna and i think just that and and they fused it in such a way I get a little confused myself, but it gets confused in such a way that creates a hybrid animal, which becomes the human being. And mm -hmm. it's basically, it's like, a, it's almost as if a chimpanzee's DNA and a human's DNA got, got fused together to form chromosome two. Now creationists for a long time tried to say that this was an example of intelligent design. Uh, and scientists right. have been trying to prove that it's completely natural. Well, they're I mean, I kind of think they're both right in a weird way. Like the answer is yeah. it's both right. Like, yeah, like you have chromosomes. So as soon as this, so the scientific explanation is this happened. It was mm -hmm. completely natural. Everything worked out fine because we know because we're here today. What the scientists don't want to admit is that the most common way in which this fusion happens in nature 
and for it to work actually in nature mm -hmm. is through domesticated breeding. That's the telltale signature of domesticated breeding. It doesn't just happen. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it just, it just doesn't happen in domesticated breeding programs, but it's common for it to happen in those programs and for it to actually work. Now, mm -hmm. if, it, if it was supposed to work according to the evolutionary model, what would have happened is that I think the first generation of kids would have been infertile, but then by the time they got to the second generation, it would have been okay. But then this type of chromosome would have had a match with this person over here. And there needed to be a catastrophic event to push them. Like it gets really convoluted with the way they describe it. I'm like, okay, so maybe, 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 maybe all of that did work. But, mm -hmm. you know, when you, when you add it all up, the fact that we don't have the LCA and we don't, and it's a common domesticated pattern, uh, breeding pattern, why not? And it's so convoluted for it to happen in nature and not introduce all kinds of other complexities that would have actually endangered that, that group, you know, from survivability. Why not just consider the third option? Like it, the, there's enough evidence for that too. Like, I don't think it's a completely whacked out theory to throw that. It's only whacked out if your mind is pre-biased towards the idea that we live in a civilization, we live in a galaxy with billions of stars and there can't possibly be anybody else on it. I mean, come on. Right. Well, it, 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 it's like what I'm going to do as soon as we, we wrap up here. I'm going to go through and I'm going to edit a video and I'm going to make it exactly the way I want it to do, right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, it, th there can definitely be an argument made that our DNA is exactly the same way, right? Like, I mean, there's all, I'm sorry, there have already been experiments with injecting viruses into into dna like yeah. literally software viruses right so not like just like you know COVID or something like that well wow. um well wow. by modifying you know the, the rna sequence hmm. you know you can in, you can introduce all sorts of interesting things yeah um and the the funny thing is is that science is not overly complicated at least i mean it's outside of my realm but yeah right um it, it's not you know super um you know out there right like i mean it, it's fairly easily done um and that's kind of why and i'm going to wrap this up in just a second i promise no it's right. um that's why i kind of believe that that aliens and all of that sort of stuff are us just further on because yeah. we're, we're already to that point or we're yeah. close to that point. That's true. And uh, my belief is that when we reach that point, that's when our civilization dies. Mm. Yeah, I, I feel like we're an offshoot. I feel like the Star Wars myth is actually based on some kind of truth that we're, we're a part of this bigger, I think, I think, first of all, I think human DNA is more of like an IP address for consciousness to embed itself. It's like the, it's the notes you need to play to get a, an abstract, consciousness of some kind to embed itself in space time and if there are other forces out there that are tweaking it they can change the model of of uh, consciousness and how it's going to play out and i and i have a feeling that humans are, are all throughout this galaxy i feel like I, I feel like the time thing gets kind of weird there's something about earth i i think earth is in some kind of weird bubble where it's in some kind of weird frequency deprived bubble that where the simulation's about to bust and we're going to, and, and the people that are able to acclimate fastest to that reality mm. are going to be the ones who survive. I, I do think a lot of people are going to have such a mind break from, like you're open-minded and that's already a key survivable, uh, a survivability attribute because, mm -hmm. because I think the fundamental throughout the whole universe is the same. We all want to be loved. We all want to love each other. We want to be safe. We want to have good lives. There might be some differences to all that, how it plays out, but fundamentally that's not a, an intelligence issue or technology issue it's just kind of a, a state but right. um but i mean i think we're all aliens anyway i think our dna is alien and it's just yeah, but if everyone is an alien then what does an alien even mean exactly yeah <laughs> so family. it's extended family I mean, basically you know we are you know whether there are, there are, are quote aliens or not yeah. in the universe is kind of immaterial yeah, right? I think I mean, we, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say like everyone, and I'm going to use that term in, in a very, you know, broad way. Um, we're all kind of aliens to, to this universe because we don't 
not fully understand it. Yeah. Yeah. So that brings up the terrifying concept of there has to be something out there that does understand it. Yeah. And that's a terrifying thing. Yeah. Is that benign? Is it, is it manipulating? You know, I mean, who knows? I, I, the only solace I take from any of this is that I think my higher self is a blueprint and a byproduct from the eternal self, which is, which is something that permeates the, it's what the aliens draw their force, their, their intelligence mm -hmm. and sentience from as well. And that thing is a constant. What we're doing are variables. Um, and the variables have their own symphony to play. And, and, you know, you want to play the best notes you can. Uh, but if right now I feel like, like Neil waking up on the, uh, on that ship and getting offered that, that bowl of like shitty corn soup right. and like, <laughs> it's like, this is all there is. I mean, what's the point of waking up if all you're going to get is the, the corn slop. But I'm hoping that, um, I'm hoping that what happens for me in my personal life is that if I keep bringing online, you know, in my physical body, some of this dormant higher self potential, my life will get a little bit more secure or at least aligned. Mm -hmm. And whatever this big thing is, like, like you said, you know, it's, it's terrifying, but, but I think that's us too. I think that big terrifying thing is actually just you in a dark corner, unable to articulate itself rationally. And instead, um, is waiting for a chance to come online and play out and bust this simulation wide open. Right. And what happens after that? I don't know, but I think we've all been, baby's been put in the corner for too long. I think we've all had that. <laughs> we were born with amnesia. You know, we were born with amnesia. We we're born with limited cognitive and emotional. And I, I, I think that, I think there's fundamentally, I think the universe is fundamentally good. That being said, it's like the oil in your car. When you go over a hundred thousand miles and you haven't changed your oil, you're going to get problems. So, sure. you know, like it's, it's, it's a matter of like course correction versus, or, or rediscovery versus, I mean, this is just my upbeat mind, you know, mm -hmm. playing this out, but I've had a lot of darkness too. I've seen a lot of darkness. I've had a lot of negative experiences. There's I don't a lot of darkness out there. Yeah. I don't I, de deny it. You know, I, I read an article a couple of days ago. Um, about, I, I think it had something to do with, with aliens and whatnot, but the part I took out of it was this person was saying, as humanity, what do we do? We create shit. So we create shit and then we go through the cycle where we create slightly better versions of what we just created. Yeah. And the, the imagery that came into my mind was like ants, right? Like ant, ants are the ultimate creators. No, yeah. you know yeah. they band together they create something no yeah. they move on to the next thing they make it a little bit better you yeah. know or beavers like i mean th there's so many examples in the animal world yeah and it when i read the article um which i'll find and send to you at some point yeah um it made me think like okay well that's what i do right i mean like literally that's what i do like i create software and i create better versions of it and better versions and better and my entire life is basically spent doing that yeah and you know even somebody who who works at walmart for example right so they they're there they facilitate buying things they they facilitate um you know new trends in 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 you know purchasing and, and whatnot like everything we do is making the past a little bit better so it, yeah. we, we create this whole thing we're like we're gonna you know yeah. create this this better version of something that we did you know a year ago or five years ago or 50 years ago right right um have you heard of buckminster fuller he was the guy that invented the uh, geodesic dome he was a he's a famous guy um mm -hmm. He had a great quote and it was humans are individual local space time problem solvers that the universe creates. They're almost like little I love it. thoughts. Yeah. So I feel like the problem is like we might be, so we're born to create our own little universes, our own little um, abstractions that have meaning. But like the question is what is meaningful is really, mm -hmm. if meaning comes through conflict, fine. If meaning comes through love, fine. But like, like ultimately when we say we're improving the world, we have, I don't think people are ab are adding the metric of meaning because that used to be a religious thing. 
that mm -hmm. became problematic. But now the, the purely secular version is problematic. So it's kind of like, because that's why we're all on Twitter being assholes to each other. So really, who who measures meaning? And, and I think there's a component to the universe that actually we're connected to that can, but we, we just sort of like, we either need this conflict to figure it out or we're going to go through it regardless to figure it out. And I think, I mean, that's just my personal thought. I'm, I try to be upbeat. I'm not always upbeat about it, but mm -hmm. I have a feeling that we have tasks assigned to us from either unconscious some would say God. I don't. I don't know what to believe about that. But I think mm -hmm. we're supposed to be functioning on some level in a capacity that we're not functioning right now because of limitations we're, we're being pushed into. And I think that's the ultimate point. And I don't think it's going to come pain free though. Right. So I, you and I disagree on that a little bit because I, I believe we're doing exactly what we're supposed to do. Oh, okay. But we just don't understand what that is yet. That's true. Yeah, I hear you. Um, again, it's it's like the ants, right? Mm -hmm. Like, do you think an ant knows when they built a colony what they're doing? Mm -hmm. Or do they just do it because that's what they do? Well, the ants have the benefit of not having any rational mind to compete with their instinct to, to do it. Like, they're just... That we one. know of. Well, that's true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we don't know. I hope they don't get smart, man. Well, maybe they are, though. So, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, uh, hmm. um, it, it's like, you know, talking about, um, what, what's the book? Oh my God. Super, super famous. Um, Douglas Adams. I can't think of the name of the book to save my life, <laughs> but it, it's, it's like that, huh. um, where people just do shit, yeah. but they don't, they don't know what, what their, their grand design is. They just do it. Well, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I, I think ants are kind of the same way. I think they're yeah. just like, okay, um, but they they do possibly understand that that they're doing something more than what they're doing, right? Huh. So just like humans. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like we don't we don't think about the yeah. the grand thing that we're doing, right. um, or if we do, we're we're probably misguided. Yeah. Um, we just do shit and we do it almost by rote. Yeah, there's there's probably, but then there's probably, hopefully, hopefully there's a difference between people that are doing that. And I've heard this term used by people in the simulation theory world, uh, automaton, is that the word? For right, Auto automatons, yeah. Yeah, automatons. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wonder sometimes if some of these people in my life are just automatons because I'm just like, mm -hmm. I don't know. But I believe, I do, I get what you're saying and I believe it's true. I think it's just an, another way of saying it. Um, I feel like my journey has been, I've, I've always tried to, I want to know what's rationally from a conceptual mind's point of view. I want to know mm -hmm. why, what I'm doing. But the more I live my life, the more I kind of, maybe I more agree with what you're saying is that we're just live what we what we see and think and feel is a limited part of a grander push that's happening from us inside somewhere that we're not going to maybe ever know. Um, I right. try to figure it out, but maybe there's no way to really ever know, you know, you know, so th this is a great place to, to kind of like, you know, in this yeah. conversation and, and set up for the next one. Yeah. Um, my feeling is that we do know what we're doing. Hmm. but we can't process it because it, it's too outlandish and and that's that's probably where religion comes from it, it it's trying to explain what mm -hmm. we're doing in in a way that that's quasi rational hold on a second i want to show you something this, okay perfect this book right here if you ever pick this up or, it's a really hard to find book it's, it's called uh the symbolic quest Ooh, I, I love the title yeah it's good it's edward c edward c whitmont um he was a carl jung guy and then he was a spinoff of carl jung and mm -hmm. he's, he's saying a very similar thing like the the part of us that we can't know that's doing this in their word is they call it the self that's the that's the carl jungian term for it right mm -hmm. and maybe it's transrational it doesn't have the ability to be understood by the conscious mind dreams give you indications maybe of what it wants or where it's trying to take you. And then it's sort of this relationship that your ego has to form in space time. Mm -hmm. This thing lives outside space time. It lives outside any kind of time based system. The ego lives in space time. So the ego's job is to try to steward 
the flow and create, but, it, but the ego has to be strong enough to be cemented in reality, mm -hmm. but it has to be porous enough to take input from the drive that's coming through it. So it's, it's a cool book that I will definitely check that out. I mean, it's a tough read. It, it's, there's a lot of shit in there that I'm just like, my God, like I can't well, I write mean, you know, Young was not <laughs> very easy to read, you know, <laughs> on his own. So yeah. Somebody yeah. who's, you know, extrapolating upon that. Yeah, I could see that being, you know, yeah, I, guess, I mean, you would handle it just fine, but I, I want to share it with everybody. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, there's no way most people are going to get through it. Not, not that I'm trying to sell the intellectual elite, but like the, the words that they use are like vernacular for guys like us and people like us who have right. studied. But like, if you, if you haven't studied any of these concepts, like you're going to be like, what the fuck is this guy saying? Right. It, it, it's it was like the first time I, I came across the word transubstantiation. And I was like, the fuck is that? You know, and I, I still have a hard time wrapping my head around it. I don't know what that means. I don't um, know. You know, it, it's basically that. Okay. And this will be the last thing we talk about. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. It, it's basically the, the concept of, of Christ becoming real through the act of, of, you know, drinking the wine and, and eating the cracker basically. So it, it's, it's taking a concept that is, real at least in quotes um oh, I but but through some action right you make it visible so yeah. it's something that that is is uh, quote real yeah but you can't see and it's gonna you take this action yeah myths like myths are real in the sense that they're not they didn't really happen but the essence of what they're talking about is real like the psychological concepts are real and then if right. you live out the myth in some way maybe you make it real i don't know yeah, yeah no, fucking... I mean, the whole thing is everyone's trying to invent new words now. I can't keep up with all the new words. Yeah, trans... well, trans transubstantiation actually goes back to like the, the first century. Does it really? Oh, yeah, yeah. So it was the whole concept of, of um, taking in, again, taking in the blood of Christ yeah. as a, a physical reaction. Yeah. Right. And that is, yeah. that is like, you are literally eating the body of Christ, right? That That's, yeah. that's where it all comes from. So it, it has kind of a dark, well, at least to me and probably to you, I, I kind of dark backstory. Yeah. Um, but I think the concept is fascinating. It is. It's probably even true, you know, I mean, well, it it, funny, but... symbology, I'm sorry. Symbols are, are super important to us, right? And so doing something like that, whether it's real or not, you know, yeah, it, it has, it has an effect on, on the human psyche. I want to definitely continue that because that's all this book is about is how latent symbology is the archetypical blueprint in your psyche that's waiting for you to make it real. And, and so that's the other reality. We, we live in a trans, we live in a rational reality for the most part that we think, but the truth of life, the generative power of all physical matter. It's like, it's like the law of attraction, but the, the thing that the law of attraction gets wrong is that people in the law of attraction, I think, think that if they just think something, it's going to come true. But it's like, right. uh, there's like a lot of stuff now on polyvagal theory. We, again, we're going off the deep rails deep in here. <laughs> polyvagal theory is vagal nerves, vagal nerve resetting, resetting your vagal, vagus nerve, because your vagus mm -hmm. nerve is the core indicator of your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system if mm -hmm. that vagus nerve is toned incorrectly from previous trauma it's going to create reactions in your physical body that have nothing to do with what's happening in the real world it's all in your mind right so and that in turn creates your environment making your environment adversarial or whatever so and symbols uh, this is a little bit different but symbols are the psyche's way of storing and creating power in your psychic life and then Right. And they're accessed in some way, your physical world changes. So I don't know. Hey, magic. They used to call it magic. I, I, I have I have one last question for you. And feel free to answer it as, as in depth or not as you want. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. That is. And you kind of just touched on it. So do you think your own trauma as a child mm. has expedited your search for the truth 100 percent. yeah they say that's the most common they almost some people even say this book says it that the higher self will sometimes before incarnation 
pick the most traumatic path it can in order to make sure that the ego personality that's formed can relate to the subject matter and impetus correctly so that as, as I develop or anybody develops, you form the right connection to your life purpose, but there's a gamble that it won't work because, mm-hmm. because the nature of the trauma can be so severe that the, what I find disturbing, if there is a God <laughs> and, and an afterlife, which I believe in the afterlife part, because I've had experiences we can talk about later, but mm-hmm. is that ultimately this personality and this life, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It doesn't really matter to the ultimate right. self because the ultimate self will just incarnate a new life. So if you care about your personality and you care about your sense of self, it, it seems it behooves, I think, people to like be as good a version as they can. But to answer your question, everything I've ever experienced has taught me that, you know, my experiences in life, which are not unique, by the way, mm-hmm. um, did something to make sure that I would stay on track and not get distracted on another life path that had nothing to do with whatever, you know, our, our collective purpose are is, you know, like the ants have their purpose. I think I have some purpose with communicating these types of concepts, you know, that's my guess. Okay. And I have, I'm, I lied. I have one kind of (laughs) follow-up question. Yeah. Has it helped you? What? uh, Like your life path, like, uh, you know, digging into some of this stuff, has it helped your trauma? Yeah. I'm much more, I'm much more functional. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, not to sound dramatic, but I took a, I took one of those ACE surveys, which tell you like where you stack up in terms of stuff that's happened to you. And I, I scored so low that I should have been dead at 19, apparently, according to this thing. Wow. But again, I'm, I'm one of the many people that go through trauma. I'm not, I would say that um, as of right now, I'm pretty happy with who I am mm-hmm. in general. And I, I feel like I stuck to my guns making these films i'm not rich you know i'm not whatever but Mm -hmm. i would say that i'm authentic and i think god if there's one thing that i'm still struggling with i've made progress on but the one thing that is the most important thing for any human being on this planet is they they got to figure out what their authenticity authenticity really is because it's paramount to the survival of the species like people people think it's think it's about being you no it's not about if the more you are you the more service you're going to provide to species because everybody has to play their part. If they can't play it optimally, they're, they're compromising not just themselves, but everybody else. If you're meant to be an asshole, then please be the biggest asshole you can be because you probably serve in a higher good. Okay. You might just be an asshole too. I don't know, but like, that's the gamble you have to I, take, right? I, yeah, that's <laughs> funny. I don't mind being an asshole. Yeah, um, yeah it's necessary. I, I did as a kid. But yeah. now I don't. I don't. I don't give. Contra- were you called a contrarian? Because that's what I was always called. You're contrarian. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a reason this whole thing is called curmudgeon, curmudgeon chat, right? Um, it, it's basically you know the concept came from from me sitting in bars and randomly meeting people and and having these these weird conversations. Yeah. Um, and even back in my twenties, I was called a curmudgeon. Hmm. You know, like it, it's just whatever it, i've embraced it yeah uh, it sure. took it took 20 or 30 years but you know hey I, I i'm way behind too like i i'm just i feel like i'm now just getting to the point where i'm comfortable enough to talk about this stuff with you mm-hmm. and other people and not feel self-conscious i used to feel really self-conscious about it because i grew up with that stigma of being the weirdo and the, and not normal but i've seen how much it's helped people I, I don't think people realize especially with covid like the value of sharing your thoughts your feelings your intentions mm-hmm. with other people your, if your intention is to get to the truth, that's a beautiful thing. It's a noble thing and it's helpful. Yeah. And so much, yeah, there's just, there's so much fear and confusion right now. Any effort I think that goes towards talking about at the very least, whether mm-hmm. you're right or wrong, moves the ball forward. And life is not about scoring goals sometimes. It's sometimes it's literally about moving that ball, you know, like two inches. Right. I had cancer. When I, when I had cancer, I had to learn that lesson the hard way. It was like, I had right. to like, Every day was a win. If I didn't kill mm-hmm. myself or die the day before, yeah. that's how you have to measure your life sometimes. And so, yeah, I think I think like authenticity is the number one thing because you can never make other people happy like you can make yourself. You know what I mean? Yeah, and if you and if you are no and if you're happy doing you at the utmost level, it's going to have a ripple effect. I guarantee it more than you trying to kiss someone's ass. You know, yep, I, I, I totally agree. And Rich, uh, that's a 
perfect ending point. <laughs> you know, no, it is. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, yeah. Know, like, I mean, basically, uh, to use vernacular that I actually hate, it's do you, or or I'm sorry, do you boo? <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, yeah. What, what the yeah, kids yeah. say. Yeah. The boo thing, um, yeah. you know, and yeah, I mean, there's definitely some truth in that. You know, yeah, they're really be who the fuck you are. Yeah, and it's it's hard to find that out, and it's pathologically. Uh, you, you can, there, there's all kinds of things that ways that can go wrong, but I, as a fundamental, I, I 100% think that that's the only answer anymore to any of us figuring this shit out. You know, and if each yeah. individual becomes themselves to their best ability, then you run into other people as you need to, and and you keep your life going the best you can get it, keep it going. You know. Yeah. No, I I totally agree with that. Yeah. Um, I'm glad I didn't. I mean, I can only think about if I would have said yes to my mom and my my ex and stayed a Joe witness like a, a, trying to think about mm -hmm. who i would have been if i had been that guy for 20 more years yeah yeah i know it's just like sad but the the flip side of that is like you don't know it could have been better probably not but i mean it could have been better it, it could, could have been, been a lot worse like you don't know that's true I mean, I, I have my, my issues with religion, but like, I still, I still value the old ladies that go to church on Sunday and they bring cookies for people. Like, I still oh, think, fuck they yeah. cookies, you know, so it's like, yeah. well, one of my best friends, um, ha has this thing that she, that I'm sorry, he says, um, that even though he totally doesn't believe in, in Christianity in any way, shape or form, yeah, he still goes to church on Sundays because it gives him comfort. There you go. We all need comfort, man. Yeah, and I, I don't see anything wrong with that. Hey, yeah. on that note, it was great talking to you. Yeah, likewise. Um, and I, I think honestly, we could probably have gone another two or three hours, but um, huh? let's have you on for round two. Yeah, we'll do round two, and good luck with the editing, man. I know I, you got uh, a lot the editing is going to suck. That reminds <laughs> me, I have to, I have to set that time marker. Okay, two hours forty three minutes. Okay, great. Wow. Wow. We can probably cut whatever you don't like out, but uh, do you need B-roll or anything? Are you good? Because you can always borrow Starly from the internet. I'm sure there's places to get it if you need it. Oh, oh actually, you yeah, I could probably do that. I could probably yeah, I don't care. I'm going to stop.